Milmad's Five Revelations by Alan J. Stark Illusions burst and leave behind a keener sense of facts. Unknown Chapter 1 Dominic tried to penetrate the fog that surrounded him. An unpleasant, unnatural silence pressed on his ears. Confused dream images chased through his mind. Black shadows swirled past like veils of seaweed and kelp in front of a dark abyss. Strangely shaped fish from the deep sea swam closer, detached themselves from the eternal night and stared at him with large, blind eyes. They felt for him with antennae and tentacles. They glided over his face and stroked his cheeks. Gradually, they ventured closer, touching him with sharp teeth, scratching his skin and placing suction cups on his neck. Dominic felt their fangs digging into his flesh and began to suck his blood like soft tentacles. The creatures fell upon him like vampires upon their victim. All the life in Dominic's body began to fade. He became weaker and weaker. His will to live dwindled. Fighting back seemed pointless to him. Just as he was ready to surrender to his fate, the animals broke away from him. They sped away as a ray of sunlight stabbed into the blackness like a golden lance. An angel must have thrown it to drive away the demons of hell. With it, dull light seeped into the depths, gradually gaining strength like the morning sun after a dark night. Dominic thought he was floating upwards, towards the sun, which was breaking through the darkness with increasing power. Its warmth lay gently on his face. The oppressive weight of the silence that had been weighing heavily on his ears disappeared. He became aware of the expanse of space into which he gently floated. He heard the sound of a distant surf. It wasn't the first time Dominic had fainted, but this time he wasn't looking at sterile white walls or hearing the buzzing and beeping of medical equipment. He was lying on a hard, cold floor, staring at a gray, rocky surface above him. The air was cool, damp and smelled of seaweed. He could hear the lapping of waves and the voices of people talking. The occasional cough and clearing of the throat. The grumpy rumble of an akato. Someone was swearing. Dominic thought it was Kelman. Let's hope it was worth the effort, Creek Davis, who was standing next to Stephanie, who had just leaned over Dominic and kissed him, or so Dominic thought. He could still feel the touch of her lips on his. The brief, sweet moment passed almost in the same instant as he had realized it. Suddenly, a gagging sensation tightened his chest. Dominic coughed and spit out salt water and saliva before he managed to catch his breath. Davis laughed. Welcome back. Stephanie straightened up and wiped her lips with her sleeve. Yes. Welcome to the living. Thought we'd have to put you on the casualty list. Dominic tried to stand up, but Stephanie pushed his shoulders to the floor. Take it easy. You're not going to do anything now except rest. You have a severe contusion in the chest area, added Doc Warden, who was busy tending to the injured and was feeling Dominic's ribs. At least they have strong bones. Your ribs are still as they should be. A dozen or so wounded men lay or crouched on the ground next to Dominic. The soldiers looked as bad as if they had fallen into the claws of the Skelks. It's freezing cold here, Dominic remarked. That's just her exhaustion. Warden shone a small lamp into Dominic's eyes. But you're right, of course. We need to set up a hospital, as best we can here. How are you feeling? Pain when I breathe, Dominic replied. Everything is spinning. Doc Warden opened one of the pockets on Dominic's belt which contained a number of medications, and pulled out an injection capsule. What kind of place is this? asked Dominic. A bunker, replied Skorsky, who was standing next to Davis. Naval base. It's really huge for a bunker, Stephanie objected. Full of corridors and passageways. Right down to the roots of the mountain, she continued mysteriously, as if quoting from an old book. I'd like to know what monsters are lurking in the depths and what creature the Akato have awakened that lives down there. How do you know that monsters live there, wondered Dominic, who took her words seriously, even if they didn't sound like it on the surface. I just know it. Stephanie grinned broadly. Do you think you're the only child prodigy in the universe? Dominic had a suspicion. He sensed the presence of the Skelks. 
There had to be hundreds of them. They wandered through the corridors of the station. He could sense the architecture of the building from their movements. It was as if he was scanning the course of tunnels and galleries with invisible fingers, much like a blind person would do to grasp a shape. Dominic looked at his companion questioningly and tried to formulate words, but the anesthetic the doctor had given him paralyzed his tongue. It's possible that we have more here than just a bunker, Warden defended the soldier. The large freight elevators certainly indicate that war equipment is stored down there. You just have to open your eyes a little and draw your conclusions, then you'll have many an enlightenment before you bite the dust. Dominic didn't feel like joking at the moment, but the more he tried to communicate, the weaker he felt. I could even tell you something about the structure of the plant, Stephanie continued, not without pride. Imagine an upside-down tree. First it goes a few hundred meters vertically into the seabed and then the structure branches out. There are a lot of big halls with strange machines. Weapons too, but that's the exception rather than the rule. The soldiers stared at the young woman in disbelief. Dominic noticed Davis and Skorsky exchanging a few glances. I can feel them, said Stephanie. So can you. They're here, but we'll track them down. Dominic didn't know what to make of it. How is that possible? But he didn't get a chance to ask her any more questions or warn her. It was better for Stephanie to keep the knowledge of her newly acquired abilities to herself and not brag about it. He desperately tried to formulate words, but his thoughts melted into abstract images. The injection did its work and Dominic faded back into the darkness. Chapter 2 Longhill didn't like narrow spaces or tunnels especially not when they wound through the ground many kilometers below. It was this fear that had made him do everything in his power to rise to the rank of captain as quickly as possible. In this way, he had managed to leave the ranks of the fighters who had to dig through tunnels and holes in the ground day after day. As captain, he rarely traveled with the tunnel rats and enjoyed leading the missions from the command post of the Unia. But unfortunately he had lost this rank. Now, together with his comrades and the Akato, he worked his way through the abandoned corridors of a bunker that led far into the interior of a mountain. A mountain whose tiny peak jutted out of a vast ocean. Longhill could literally feel how the pressure of the water masses weighed on the rock and increased the deeper they penetrated into the facility. At least as oppressive were the countless Kimon and Akatok carcasses rotting in the rooms. Whatever had happened here, it must have been a while ago. Many of the bodies were mummified in the dry air. Akato skulls, covered in leathery skin, stared at him with empty eye sockets. The grin of their white, bared teeth sent a shiver down Longhill's spine. Now and then they came across the remains of Akato armor, scraped clean and licked clean by Kimon teeth and tongues. Longhill felt sick at the thought of what might have happened here. He assumed that the Akato accompanying them were also wondering what had happened here. Although it was dangerous, Zurak had taken the liberty of accompanying his soldiers personally. They all followed this young woman from Raymond Davis's group, who had been calling themselves the Snowcats since their adventure on Dostra. They followed this young woman named Stephanie Dormer, who apparently now had the same abilities as Porter and trusted that it wasn't just luck that had protected her so far. However this miracle had come about, at the moment Dormer formed the core of their community of human sniffer dogs triggering every single skelk no matter where they were hiding and luring them in front of the soldiers' guns. She was good at it. As good as if she had done nothing else all her life. It was like shooting clay pigeons, and the Akato were thrilled. Zero Donna in particular seemed to be impressed by the young woman's abilities, as she never tired of dragging the skelks into the light and killing them with her mind powers. The Akato had to force her to take breaks so that she didn't exhaust herself. Longhill saw in her fevered expression a mixture of anger and the instinct of a predator that had caught the scent and was doing everything it could to keep its prey. A passion that occasionally manifested itself in short but heated verbal battles with the black-skinned Akato, who interrupted the hunt more often than Stephanie would have liked. During one of the few breaks in which Stephanie walked restlessly among the soldiers, Longhill allowed himself a little time to take a closer look at the surroundings. Over the last few hours, they had rushed through several halls where there was little war equipment to be seen. He was not surprised. 
who was going to maintain a weapons depot that was literally so far away from the action? In the middle of a vast ocean, far from any coastline. There were almost exclusively machines here that reminded him of a medical facility or a laboratory. Ableton was familiar with this kind of equipment and had already noted this at the beginning of their expedition. And Longhill was also forced to come to the same conclusion. Especially as the Akato technology here had clearly taken on the features and characteristics of human manufacturing principles. Where Akato would normally have used their tried and tested wooden structures, here there were metal and ceramic struts. Connections made of rivets and screws. Covers and housings made of plastic. The Akato seemed to have recognized the advantages of earthly technology and used them. At least here on this island, and in secret. After careful consideration, Longhill came to the conclusion that it was a research facility where medical experiments were being carried out. He had no doubt that many of these experiments had made it from here to the battlefields. However, he had never heard of any chemical or biological warfare being conducted by the Akato. In the years he had spent among the Akato, he had come to believe that they refused to use such means. It was hard to say whether they saw this as dishonorable or whether the ten legates, of whom the Akato spoke from time to time as if they were ancient gods, watched over the fact that none of the peoples of Askaruin used such means. Perhaps the inhabitants of the galaxy were now too sensible to resort to this kind of combat? He laughed at the thought. It was completely absurd. Reason was also an exception among these seemingly high civilizations, that much he had come to realize in recent years. Whatever function the ten legates fulfilled in the galaxy, they had not brought about a paradise. Either their power was not sufficient, or it was simply not their intention. Genetic experiments have been carried out here, Ableton claimed, pointing to a series of containers. There are nutrient solutions in there. And the apparatus there reminds me of face splicers. Genetic scalpels. They're probably researching the chemon here, said Longhill, deciding to say the unthinkable. To manufacture biological warfare agents. That would be conceivable. In any case, the containers are big enough to accommodate the sniffers. We should take the dock down here. I'd be interested in his opinion. What do you think about these Gothrex? Longhill wanted to know. Could they be special breeds? Breeds of the Akato? Cleese felt compelled to add his view to the conversation. For sure, he said. I think these are Zurax toys. That's why we're here. We're here to reclaim the facility and secure it. He needs it and will resume production as soon as he's replaced the staff. A secret factory. The whole facility is perfectly camouflaged. It's huge, but you can only guess that when you're down here. You think he's working on some kind of secret weapon here that his father doesn't know about? I can't say anything about that, but I have a feeling. The island is so inconspicuous that I'm sure it's insignificant even to Akato eyes. A tiny rock in the endless ocean. I think it's the only reason he wanted to go to Barathon. That's why he came here as soon as the attack on the city went wrong. You're saying the attack was just a pretext? Ableton frowned. That would be a pretty extensive diversion. Longhill shook his head. No. I think he wanted both. Conquer the planet and get the factory back. But without drawing too much attention to this little island. I still wonder if his father knows about this. Longhill was stumped. I don't know what kind of games they play with each other. But if you look at the history of the Earth as a comparison when it comes to the hankapanky of noble houses, then you should consider all possibilities. Klee seemed to have another topic on his mind. I'd like to know why we can't perceive the Gothrex the way we can the Sklex. If they come from the same source, surely that should be possible? Ableton had an opinion on this. Maybe the breeding is affecting parts of her brain and disabling the part that allows us to connect. Longhill rubbed his chin. I wonder if that's deliberate, or just an incidental aside. It was a disturbing fact. The Gothrex were huge beasts and, in his eyes, bore too much resemblance to the Skelks to consider them allies. The fact that they could sneak up and attack unnoticed frightened him. If it came to a fight among the Akados, the guardsmen would be useless as protection for their masters. 
on the contrary. The human soldiers would then only be a burden that the Akados would have to get rid of quickly. Perhaps Longhill's thoughts were going too far, but the very fact that Zurak was keeping secrets from his father put all his previous fears to rest. The Akado civilization was about to split, and Zurak was preparing for it, or driving it forward. If we get the chance, joked Ableton, snapping Longhill out of his thoughts, we should show the doc what we found here. I'd be interested to see what conclusion he comes to. First we went deeper into the facility. It took a few hours before Zero Donna decided to downsize the force. Only 31 people, including Stephanie Dormer of course, and a handful of Akato soldiers remained to continue the hunt for the Skelks. Zero Donna told the rest to return up to the harbor bay and await further orders. We probably won't be needed for the showdown, remarked Longhill, who, along with Cleese and Ableton, was not among the chosen ones. I can do without it, commented Cleese. I'll be glad when I'm back in the light of day. More than before, Longhill felt the walls moving closer together as the weight of the ocean pressed against the rocks. He knew he was imagining it, but he was less and less able to counter the power of his thoughts. What he felt was far more than a diffuse fear, as Doc Warden used to put it. It was not diffuse or nebulous. It was palpable, like a boulder resting on his chest, preventing him from breathing. That was why he was more than happy about Odana's order, even if he wondered what criteria Kado had used to select the people. It was neither the soldiers with experience nor the youngest fighters who would advance further into the mountain with the Akado. What are you brooding about? Cleese wanted to know. Nothing, the former captain rebutted. Doesn't look like it. Longhill stared after the troop as it marched down a long ramp and finally disappeared from his field of vision. But look at it this way, Cleese reassured him. It's not your people anymore. It's not your responsibility anymore. Of course, it wasn't that simple. And Cleese should know that too. You don't just give up responsibility. At least not internally. You remained captain, even if the epaulets were no longer there. Longhill himself didn't know what exactly was worrying him about the whole situation. The small squad would be able to cope with the Skelks as long as Dormer didn't lose her mind or her abilities. We should keep our eyes and ears open, said Longhill. Right now, I can't say what to make of our great friends. That's nothing new, Cleese waved it off. There's always something new, replied Longhill. The situation is always changing. He finally had to tease some information out of Davis and Skorsky. It seemed all too likely to him that they had special experiences with the Akado. They could no longer keep it to themselves. Chapter 3 Stephanie felt the Skelks. She felt the proximity of the monsters much more intensely than before. Their presence felt like thorns sticking into Stephanie's flesh. Especially when the creatures moved, they seemed to dig deeper and deeper into her body. Images and emotions flare up sharply and clearly in her mind. At times they overlaid the real impressions that Stephanie's eyes were sending to her brain. She saw the strange tree that had fallen a few hours ago, burying an entire town beneath it. Old images, from the memory of one of the monsters. Then the scene changed. The town was the same and the huge tree was unharmed. Everything was deep in snow and peaceful. A snowstorm had just passed and a few scattered flakes were dancing down. The sun broke through the clouds and shone from a sky that glowed a beguiling deep blue. Other impressions were of a completely different nature. They showed Akato soldiers being torn to pieces by the claws and fangs of the Skelks. Screams, roars. The sight and taste of blood spurting into her eyes and mouth. Then the hot kiss of a plasma charge that burned her face. The slash of a blade piercing through skin, muscle, and sinew. The flood of visions was almost unbearable. Even the mantra of her meditation, which was supposed to help her focus on her own thoughts again, was increasingly failing to have the desired effect. Stephanie would only have peace from the visions when she had hunted down all the skelks. She still formed the core of the now shrunken unit, which penetrated even deeper into the floors of the station. Zero Donna did not leave her side, holding her heavy rifle in her hands. The woman was a good shot as she had proved in the last few hours. 
what criteria did you use to select the people? Stephanie von der Ocado wanted to know. It didn't take Zero Don a long to answer. Combat prowess and prudence. The absence of fear. We have the best of the best here. Stephanie felt the Skelks approaching from one of the side corridors. They're coming from there, she said, pointing the muzzle of her gun in the direction of some entrances that led into the hall they were crossing. They're still on the lower floors, but they're going up fast. There are eight of them. An older soldier raised his rifle. His expression revealed that he too had captured the Skelks in his thoughts. I've got them. They're almost there. I'll take the one in the lead. Before the monsters could even start their attack, they were shot to pieces by precise volleys. Eight thorns detached themselves from Stephanie's flesh. Several images flared up briefly and went out forever. She felt better and the renewed success spurred her on. However, she soon missed the challenge. In the beginning, the mere possibility of shooting the Skelks and Rose before they even realized their situation had been amusing. But now it was starting to get boring. We could make up a game, Stephanie suggested. I missed the spice in the whole thing. Yes, let's think of something, said one of the soldiers. How about one of us goes ahead and you? No games, thundered Zero Donna. We're not going to risk anything. Because this station is so valuable and we could break too much, the soldier added. Because you are too valuable, Akato replied. You are the guardsmen of Zurak Mestre. Stephanie managed to summon up all her composure not to respond to Zero Donna with a flippant remark. Precisely because they were the guard of the prince's son, she should trust the troop to take a little more risk. I see it as training, Stephanie hissed. There's hardly any danger. We'll stay together, the Akata ordered sullenly. We'll kill all the Kimon hiding here. But we're not going to play games. The descent to the lowest levels of the station took several more hours. They would have made faster progress, but they still encountered Skelks, who continued to pose no significant threat. Zero Donna never took her eyes off Stephanie the whole time. Obviously fascinated by the young woman's abilities, she always stayed close to her. Stephanie had been wondering for a while where she had gotten this sudden talent. Until a few hours ago, there had been no sign of it. It was only when they reached the island that she began to feel the presence of the Skelks more clearly than ever before. Was it the environment, she wondered? Were there substances in the rock that triggered this ability in her? Or were there magnetic lines that unfolded their effects here in a special way? She had heard that there was such a thing. Ancient peoples on earth were said to have built their temples along these invisible lines or marked spiritual places at their intersections. Was this island such a place? If so, why was she the only one with these heightened abilities? None of her comrades seemed to have outgrown themselves. If her reasoning about invisible lines of force was correct, Dominic must be a god by now. A god of war who could single-handedly destroy all the enemy insects. It would be interesting to have him here now, but the stupid guy had gotten a bruise and almost drowned if she hadn't pulled him out of the water. The thought of Dominic gave her a completely different idea. She instinctively felt her stomach and couldn't suppress a surprised sigh. What happened? Akato wanted to know. Stephanie was unable to articulate an answer. Had the Akato taken precautions in case there were offspring among the mixed male and female troops? She hadn't seen a nursery on the Nugo, but that didn't necessarily mean it didn't exist. The ship was huge and the area in which they were housed was certainly only a small part of the hospital complex. Of course, it could also be that the Akato were not prepared for human babies and the effort involved or did not want to take on this burden. In any case, it was risky to come out with this knowledge. She decided to keep her secret for the time being. I haven't eaten for hours, Stephanie claimed, and she wasn't even lying. Driven by hunting fever, she had completely forgotten about her hunger. Now that she realized this, her stomach began to growl. Stephanie had her own provisions, but Zero Donna pulled one of her food bars from her belt and broke off a piece, which she handed to Stephanie. A gesture of friendship, Stephanie concluded, and tasted it. The stuff had the consistency of sawdust and tasted like it. 
she chewed on it for ages until she finally managed to swallow the scratchy lump. Nevertheless, it was an honor when an Akado deigned to share food with someone. She couldn't remember Dominic ever being the recipient of such attention, given the skills he had so often demonstrated on Dostra. She smiled at Zero Donna, but the woman's ebony face remained motionless. Her thoughts seemed to be elsewhere. And whether she wanted to or not, for Stephanie there was something dark and sinister about her expression that gave her goosebumps. How many more skelks can you locate? The Akato asked abruptly. Stephanie didn't have to think twice. 31, she informed Zero Donna. That leaves one skelk for each person to do. Stephanie grinned. We have to be careful to share fairly. You've done a good job. With the help of my comrades. Yes, they are very good. We've rarely had such a perfect squad. But without you, we would have had a lot of problems. Stephanie took the opportunity to ask Akato a few questions. What actually happened to the guardsmen? With the troop that looked after Zurak before us? Were our predecessors killed in a battle? Zero Donna's face took on the enigmatic expression of a basalt bust again. It's quite unusual that they all. I mean, that they all got it at once. And Zurak? Was he with them? That is, were they with him to protect him? Stephanie pondered as she formulated her words. Didn't he get anything? It certainly doesn't look like it. But if it had been such a bad fight, with the whole troop. Stephanie paused to organize her thoughts. The look on Akato's face made her shiver. It must have been hard for Zurak, too. Zero Donna averted her eyes. Who says it wasn't, she finally muttered to herself. Everyone makes sacrifices. Everyone has their scars. Not all of them are visible. The answer did not satisfy Stephanie. Zurak did not look like he had recently fought a hard battle and suffered internal scars. I assume they were killed in battle, Stephanie probed further. Since none of the old squad was left, they must have all been killed at once. An accident during one of Zurak's ill-advised operations? The image of Zurak, completely unharmed and fighting to the point of exhaustion, standing over the corpses of the guardsmen and killing the last Kimon seemed somehow absurd to her. Was Zurak the only survivor? We will now concentrate on our enemies again, said Akato, still evasive. There will be time for all other questions later. It went on. Earlier than the soldiers had hoped. Many of them were tired after the fighting and the march in the gloomy corridors. Some vented their displeasure in short, angry comments. The Akato ignored the annoyance of their little comrades and led the troop further down into the station. Here the corridors became much narrower and there were hardly any larger halls containing equipment and vehicles. Strange machines and apparatus protruded from the ceilings and walls. The facility looked more and more like a hospital or laboratory complex. Where are the Skelks? asked a young soldier walking behind Stephanie. Where are they from? Stephanie was surprised. The Skelks had not moved so far. They seemed to be expecting their opponents and lying in wait. That made it all the easier, Stephanie told herself, as one of the Akata warriors walked up to a large bulkhead and opened it. The double leaf door opened like a dragon's mouth. One part slid slowly into the floor, the other into the ceiling. The view of a huge, dark room was revealed, in which several columns of light shimmered. They illuminated a number of skelks trapped in transparent containers. They were floating in a clear liquid and appeared to be unconscious. Stephanie could see in the semi-darkness that there were many more of these tanks in the hall. They staggered in endless rows as far as her eye could see. The humans continued to advance, pointing their weapons at the sniffers in the tanks as if they might come to life and attack at any moment. Are there any more? asked one of the soldiers. I'm only registering these. Stephanie shook her head. She had counted the containers with a skelk in them. They were paralyzed and their thoughts were calm. They seemed to be dreaming. Usually, the images their thoughts produced would crash into their minds with the force of a churning ocean hitting the shore. Now the skelk's consciousness rested like the surface of a still and deep lake. What should we do now? One of the older female soldiers wanted to know. Kill them all? 
she pointed her weapon at one of the containers and aimed at the skelk inside. Bam! Stephanie was, of course, at a loss. It was not her place to destroy the containers and their contents, which the Akato obviously still had plans for. However, she was interested to know what those plans were. She turned to Zero Donna, who was standing with her fellow Akato at the entrance to the room. They had all put on their breathing masks and the door behind them was closed again. The sight of Akato was irritating. Stephanie didn't get a chance to ask Zero Donna a question. The next second, clouds of gas hissed from the ceiling and from small nozzles in the floor. It took effect immediately and Stephanie went to her knees. The guns slipped from her comrade's hands as they went limp. The sound of falling bodies hitting the ground penetrated Stephanie's fogged mind like a drumbeat. She thought she was falling into an abyss. Deeper and deeper she whirled down into the darkness. Stephanie lost all sense of space and time and could not tell how long the fall had lasted. An endless fall into a night without stars, in which she lost all materiality and floated along as a cloud of thoughts. Was that her soul, which had detached itself from her body and was now drifting through the afterlife, far from all physics? She began to panic. Until she suddenly plunged into visions that emerged from the darkness. Images of strange places, strange beings and cultures. She saw cities and landscapes of bizarre beauty. Gradually, she dawned from her unconsciousness. She became aware of her body, which was reassembling itself out of nothing. Molecule by molecule. Atom by atom, until she had her eyes back to stare into the darkness again. High above, a blue midday sun shone. Its light filtered through the water above Stephanie's head, but it didn't warm her. A lonely, cold star, in eternal night. Little by little, shapes emerged from the blackness. Skelks hovering next to Stephanie, like pale ghosts. She recognized her comrades. Naked and asleep, they hung in the weightlessness. Each wrapped in the light of their own cold sun. The figures of Akato became visible, standing in front of Stephanie like visitors to a temple, in front of a shrine. Zero Donna, with her mysterious, cool features, stepped closer. Her dark skin shone like polished basalt in the glow of the icy star. Stephanie could see her sensual lips forming words, but she didn't understand what she was saying. Stephanie put out her hands to touch the Akata woman, but her fingers bumped against an invisible barrier. A barrier that surrounded her on all sides and held her captive. Panic began to rise again as she began to kick and thrust her hands and feet against the glass that surrounded her. She breathed the liquid she was swimming in. Heavy and sluggish, it filled her lungs. With the last breath that left her chest, she let out a silent scream that bubbled out of her mouth in silvery bubbles. She saw the Akados turn away and leave the room. Stephanie wriggled helplessly in her container until the light went out and she sank into a deep swoon. Chapter 4 Dominic felt a little better after Doc Warden's treatment. He was able to stand up and agreed to go on patrol. Roderick Miles had been unofficially in charge of the troop since the young Serwan had put him in charge of combat training and made sure that no one was left unoccupied. According to some soldiers, it was unnecessary to patrol this small rock in the middle of nowhere, but Roderick Miles saw it as a way to keep his soldiers busy. Dominic's bruises hurt and he found it difficult to breathe. But it certainly wouldn't get any better in the stuffy air of the dock. Besides, he could ease the discomfort with painkillers. It was certainly better than dismantling weapons or having to assist the document. There was power and a few areas could be supplied with electricity but that probably didn't apply to the dock circulation system. The water in it sloshed oily against the quay walls and was riddled with brownish-green algae that spread a foul odor in the stagnant air. What Dominic was least comfortable with, however, was the fact that Stephanie had been assigned to a strike team to penetrate the station's tunnels a few hours ago. After all, Longhill, his former officers and a few others had just returned and didn't seem worried or tense. Except for Longhill. But he always looked serious and suspicious, which didn't mean much, as Dominic now knew. It was easier to tell from Cleese and Ableton's behavior when the mood or situation changed. Nevertheless, Dominic needed certainty if he didn't want to spend the next few hours brooding. 
so he asked Longhill and was at least told that he didn't need to worry about Stephanie. The base is as good as cleared of Skelks, his former superior informed him. And she'll be able to cope with the remaining snoops. She's traveling with the best soldiers you could wish for. Nevertheless, the former captain's assessment reassured him only marginally. After all, Longhill had no idea that Zurak and Zero Dana were looking for the prodigy who had the ability to locate every single Kimon at great distances. Dominic didn't yet know exactly what that meant for him, but it didn't sound positive and Stephanie had unwillingly become the focus of the two Akato. Has Zero Dana been behaving strangely? Dominic wanted to know. No different than usual, said Longhill. But I must say, I'm irritated to be surrounded by two highly gifted sniffer dogs now. Seems like an epidemic has broken out. Or how do you explain that? I don't know. But how did Odana react to it? Longhill frowned and rubbed his chin. How do you think she should react? She told me on the ship that the whole thing with the Unia had stirred up a lot of dust. She then started to take a keen interest in us and seems to have come across certain incidents in the mines. Cleese cleared his throat. You mean your little magic shows that your girlfriend is currently scoring points with the Akato? Exactly her, Dominic replied. She tried to find out about the boy wonder, but the team kept tight-lipped. Longhill jovially placed his hand on Dominic's shoulder. And so will you. His voice was a whisper, cutting like the hiss of a snake. Dormer, as I can now imagine, has drawn too much attention to herself. But we can avoid another mistake by keeping her behind bars. He didn't need to explain that to Dominic. He would have warned Stephanie, but the dose of anesthetic the doc had given him had been too strong. They said I had nothing to worry about. That's right. You don't need that. She's important to the Akato. Why would they do anything to her? That didn't sound very convincing. Longhill had made an effort, but he had not succeeded in concealing his skepticism. The former captain seemed to have something on his mind, but he didn't think it was the right time to say what it was. He cast a scrutinizing glance at the Akados standing nearby. Don't worry about it, he reassured them and then left with his three friends. Dominic was by no means reassured. For some reason, his concerns were mounting, even though Longhill had given him no concrete evidence to support his worries. If he went by his assessment, Stephanie would hunt down all the Skelks and return a hero. The patrol that had set off an hour earlier finally arrived. Miles assigned Dominic two companions to accompany him. Two boys, about Dominic's age. The shorter one had black hair and looked a little chubby. His name was Paco Mendoza. He claimed to be from Tijuana, south of Los Angeles. Paco spoke with a Spanish accent and appeared to be in a good mood. The other was the exact opposite of him. He was taller than Dominic and bald. His narrow, pale face gave him a Nordic look and his name matched it. I'm Pete Erickson, he said in an irritated undertone and pulled the shoulder straps of his tornister tighter. If you keep your mouth shut on the way, we'll get along fine. Stick to Paco if you want to talk. Provided he lets you have your say. He's always in a bad mood, added the Mexican, grinning broadly. Then he threatens. He's afraid you might spoil his bad mood. A good mood is just one of many moods. And moods are for girls. Good humor is where wisdom is. But then I'm amazed. Dominic was surprised. As far as he had noticed, the two of them were always together and seemed to be close friends. I've already noticed. I'm always arguing, like an old married couple. Paco raised his shoulders. No. Not all the time, anyway. Pete knows that I'm intellectually superior to him. That's why he prefers to keep his mouth shut and avoids arguing. Even a fool is considered clever if he keeps quiet. Erickson shouldered his rifle. The fool's about to punch you in the cheek. Whether he wanted to or not, the two squabblers took Dominic away from his gloomy thoughts. He desperately needed to give his nerves a break to clear his mind again. They left the harbor by walking across the quay. Past the wrecked Jitta, which lay half-sunk in the harbor basin. Where they stepped out into the open and left the shelter of the rocky outcrop, a flight of steps began, 
leading up the cliff face. The distance and height of the steps were designed for a kato and it was difficult to find a rhythm that made the climb easier. The bare stone that flanked the stairs and rose vertically into the air glowed in the sunlight. The heat it radiated made Dominic's forehead sweat as they climbed meter by meter. Once they had climbed the stairs, a narrow path led onwards, winding through a small palm grove. The plants had thin, brown trunks and crowns of tufts of long, blue-green thorns. They looked like sea urchins that a crazy gardener had stuck on skewers and planted in a bizarre park. The palm trees offered only sparse shade and did little to alleviate the strain of the piercing sun. Tall, brittle grass grew between the trees, with sharp edges that could cut you. All in all, this oasis was not an inviting place to linger and take a break. In the short time they had been walking, Peiko had already told Dominic his whole life story and expressed his regret at having missed his youngest sister's wedding. He had been persuaded by Akato recruiters to seek his fortune among the stars. By people who painted him life in Askarun in the most colorful of colors and shipped him off on an Akato ship with a group of losers. Dominic had heard that the Akato had allowed humans onto their ships for a while. But that had probably been the exception. In any case, Dominic's journey to the Horseheads had been far more arduous and risky. Peiko told a story from the time when America had just been colonized by the Europeans. The story of one of his ancestors, whose example he had unconsciously followed. He was convinced that the experiences of his ancestor also foreshadowed Peiko's fate. It was an Indian from South America. Peiko emphasized that it had been an Aztec called the Cunning Snake, to which Pete laughed cautiously. As far as Peiko knew, Cunning Snake had approached one of the sailors in a canoe and managed to claw onto the rigging below the bowsprit. Bowsprit, Pete repeated. How does he know all this? He hung there for a whole day and a whole night, Peiko continued, until the sailors brought him on board. From what he knew, Cunning Snake first became a scullion and helped with all kinds of work. But after a short time, he worked his way up to the rank of bosun, Peiko recounted proudly. When we went ashore, he proved to be a skilled hunter who supplied the crew with meat. At least that cunning snake was brave, Pete interjected. You just fell for false promises, you dreamer. Yes, I was stupid enough to go along with it too, Peiko admitted regretfully. I have no problem with that. Who hasn't fallen victim to their hopes before? Peiko had spoken an indisputable truth that even Pete could not counter with a stupid comment. I was in the mood for an adventure, Peiko continued. But actually, I had no other choice and had to go on an adventure. And if I could become a hero and see interesting things in the process, why not? I was in serious trouble. And I had this dream. The dream of coming back with my pockets full and bringing prosperity and prestige to my family. As a knight in shining armor, punching the bad guys in our neighborhood in the face. Pete laughed quietly but audibly to himself. I didn't know that the Akado had recruiters, Dominic wondered. Advertisers and grapplers, Peiko added. Humans. Our police and military have been hunting them down. The Snatchers are really bad guys. Bounty hunters, nothing else. If recruiting doesn't bring in enough recruits, they just grab some to fill their quota. The things you can hear, said Pete in mock admiration. You should get a helmet with really big earmuffs. So you don't even get them blown off. I'm interested in everything. And I actually have very good ears. Make sure your head doesn't burst. It's already blown up anyway. Peiko did not respond to Erickson's teasing. But most of us are castaways who were picked up by the Akato by chance and didn't have the heart to throw them back into space. Just like we would take in a puppy or kitten that we found freezing and starving in the rain. Just like Pete. They pulled him out of a wreck. He was on the verge of starvation. Like I said. A freezing, hungry little kitten. The kitten is about to kick your ass. How did you and your buddies end up with us? Peiko wanted to know from Dominic. Via one of the towers, Dominic replied. Yes, I've heard about that possibility too. But isn't that dangerous? There's said to be a lot of riffraff there. They say it's more of a miracle if you make it to one of the towers. I'm sure you've noticed that I'm the boy wonder, haven't you? 
Peiko laughed. Yes, I did. At first we thought you were a weirdo. Pete seemed to feel like joining in the conversation after all. You didn't answer Peiko's question. Dominic looked irritated. What question? Well, how you made it to the tower. And then onwards. With luck, Dominic replied. And especially with the diamonds in Davis's rucksack. Is that enough of an explanation? I don't want to know how many people don't even make it to one of the gates. Or die in the devastated areas before they reach the towns that have formed around the towers. Pete turned briefly to Dominic. His gaze clearly showed that he was not satisfied with his answers. The path led along the edge of the forest until it approached the massive boulder that dominated the island. The path was carved into the mountain and meandered along its flanks up to the summit. This part of the path was a challenge. Even Peiko lost his chatty mood as he sweated and gasped, trying not to lose touch with Pete and Dominic, who were ahead of him. Dominic fought against the pain pounding in his chest. Every breath stabbed into his lungs like red-hot needles, but he forced himself not to reach for another ampoule of anesthetic. He had already used too much of it and as long as he could hold back the pain, he didn't want to use it again. Who knew what might be in store for the troop while they hoped for help? The top of the massif was as flat as a viewing platform and offered an overwhelming view. The wind blew pleasantly cool as Dominic let his eyes wander over the endless expanse of water that surrounded the tiny island. There was only the ocean, nothing else. No island, no coastline. You always feel so tiny and insignificant in the face of nature, Peiko began to rant after he had recovered from his exertion. We're just nothing. A blink of an eye in eternity. This ocean will still be there when we and our children have long since crumbled to dust. It's a sad feeling when you stand by the sea and hear the surf. A symphony that has been going on for millions of years. And it will continue when we are no longer around to hear it. The thought always makes me melancholy. Makes me aware of my finiteness. Do you see Porter? That's what I mean, Pete creaked, rolling his eyes. That's why it's better not to say too many words. Because there's always someone who wears their ass on their neck and has to fart everything. I just wanted to express how sublime nature is. Nature doesn't need your help, Peiko. And it will get along fine without your psalms when you're gone and won't reappear for the next million years. The argument became too much for Dominic. Guys, he shouted at the two of them. Just shut up, both of you, all right? That's all I do, Erickson added, putting down his knapsack and taking out the water bottle. Peiko looked miffed for the first time. He sat down on the ground and stared silently at the horizon. Meanwhile, Dominic studied the surroundings. He was particularly suspicious of the palm grove they had passed through. Doesn't look like there's been an attack here. Everything is completely intact. The port says the opposite, Pete disagreed. There was definitely a fight. I haven't seen a single Kimon fighting machine, Dominic countered. And why haven't they stationed any soldiers here? There are only sniffers here, from what I've heard. I would understand that if the facility was just a shelter. But there's a lot of valuable stuff here. And the exciting stuff is apparently where Zurak went with his troop. Pete didn't say anything at first, but took a few big gulps from his water bottle. You think they were holding Snoopers prisoner here and they escaped? Looks like it. Sounds plausible, Peiko agreed. And then there was a fight. The crew of the station evacuated. Sing psalms, said Pete. Or go for a flight. Peiko ignored his bad-tempered buddy. Anyway, Zurak doesn't seem to be in a hurry to be rescued. Dominic looked at the black-haired boy in amazement. What makes you think that? Adam Hunt is in the process of putting the transmitter back into operation. There's an amazing amount of our technology in there, just like everywhere else on the base. They tried to destroy the base, but they didn't quite succeed which supports the theory of a hasty departure. The thesis, grunted Pete. Dude, you should hear yourself. I just have a bigger vocabulary in your mother tongue than you do. I'm Icelandic, Pete replied. If you had a little more sense between your big ears, you would have noticed that I speak English with an accent. 
Dominic practiced patience. So, what happened next? He asked Peiko. Adam says Zurak is very picky about the rescue team. I don't understand. Pete gargled a sip of water and then spat it out. Yes, get to the point. Peiko continued in a whisper, as if he feared being overheard. Normally, you would send out signals on all Akata frequencies, wouldn't you? Anyway, that's what I'd do if I wanted to get out of here as quickly as possible. But Zurak only wants to use one of them. He's afraid that people will get wind of the base here, Dominic concluded. Pete screwed his bottle shut and put it back in his knapsack. Can his daddy know about this? How dare you put forward a theory? Peiko teased. That was meant rhetorically, Pete replied. It's a fact that Zurak keeps secrets from his father. Not a thesis. Everyone has smelled it by now. Dominic put his fists on his hips. Do you think he's tinkering with biological, chemical warfare agents here? Are they banned in the galaxy? And if they are? I can't imagine anyone abiding by that. Not in this galaxy. His two companions were silent for a few moments until Peiko, as expected, took the floor again. That depends entirely on the ten legates, he said. They could get involved in the matter at any time and cause trouble. Dominic had heard this term several times before and, based on the statements of some of his comrades, had formed a vague picture of the entity known as the Ten Legates. It wouldn't hurt to find out a few more details. What kind of guys are they? Have you ever played a master game? asked Pete. No, replied Dominic, who found these games too time-consuming and complicated. Plus, he was always losing. My sisters are really into it. They play DDZ, or whatever it's called. Dungeons, Dragons and Zombies, Pete shook his head. That's cold coffee. But you understand the principle of the game, don't you? Yes, but it's been a long time since I got involved in a game. There is a master in each of these games. He oversees the game. He can interpret and bend the rules. Or exclude players. And that's what the Ten Legates are doing? You think Zurak could get into trouble with them? Pete raised his shoulders helplessly, but Peiko had an explanation ready. Depends on what they consider reprehensible or immoral, he said. Morality. Pete spat out the word. As if that matters in Askarun. They seem to have quite a lot of power. Could they feel compelled to destroy House Mestre? Why should they? Peiko interjected. If they're that sophisticated, they'll use other means than violence. They will appeal to reason, anything else would be too primitive. You're dreaming, hissed Pete. Violence is primitive, but effective. It's the most tried and tested method when someone won't budge. Of course they'll use violence. Or do you see a higher principle in everything we experience? Do you see reason in the fights between Akato and Kimon? Has reason afflicted our homeland and plunged it into chaos? If all this is a reflection of their rule, then I see a lot of room for violence. And how are they supposed to exercise their power? Peiko replied. Do they have an army? Of course they have an army. Angels, demons, or something. I haven't heard anything about that. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. Pete looked at the horizon and wiped the sweat from his brow. They certainly have something that secures their power and that everyone trembles about. But it's no use worrying about it. We'll be in a lot of trouble as it is if it comes to a fight with Ulan Mestre. If Adam decides to double-cross Zurak and sends a message to Zurak's father to get us all out of here, we'll be in trouble sooner than we'd like. He turned to Peiko. Do we also have to defend Zurak and risk our heads? Or is it legitimate to run away in this case? Peiko nodded seriously. A classic dilemma. Dominic dared not imagine the mess they would get into if Erickson's concerns became reality. From what he had heard so far, the Akata were not squeamish and getting caught up in a feud for the throne could mean the death sentence for them all. Chapter 5 Serwan Brooks was on the bridge of the Jaber, staring at a monitor on which he could call up all the information relating to the previous campaign. The hastily planned strike against the Kimon, which was doomed to failure from the outset. Many Akato lost their lives. 
some of the people under his command were also dead. Several battleships were lost, including the Jadira. For the moment, they could be glad that the Kimon were not concerned with the remaining part of the fleet, but were limiting their activities to Barathon. They would not be able to counter an attack by the Kimon. But Morak Maduru, who was in command of the fleet in Zurak's absence, did not allow the radio silence to be broken and the call for reinforcements to be made. Just like Morak Maduru, Serwan Brooks knew the secret of Barathon, where Zurak's secret laboratories were located. The planet was now orbited by a sizable fleet of Kimon ships. Only a small number of them would have been needed to destroy the rest of Zurak's force. But apparently Barathon was too important to the Kimon to spare a few ships to secure it. Muduru hesitated to contact Zurak's father and ask for help, even though the time was right to regroup with the arriving reinforcements. But of course Serwan Brooks knew of the Admiral's concerns and what would come to light if he notified the base on Otrokin. Zurak's campaign was supposed to take place on the world of Burich, in another sector of Askarun. Zurak had intended to fly there, but only after he had made this detour to Barathon and conquered the planet. Now both destinations were a long way off. Ulan Mestre would be furious and call all those responsible to account for this abuse of trust to avoid the word betrayal. Arthur Brooks decided to have a few words with Murak Maduru, who was standing broodingly in front of the bridge window, looking at Barathon, a small blue disc in the starry sky. We have to call for reinforcements, Brooks whispered to Akato. Immediately. And incur the prince's wrath, the admiral replied sharply. His eyes glared angrily down at the Serwan. Muduru was afraid of this step for several reasons. For one thing, he had been placed at Zurak's side on the prince's orders to keep his hot-blooded and headstrong offspring in check, and had failed. And not for the first time. On the other hand, he knew the prince well enough to know how much he liked people. This fondness, which Muduru said was basically nothing more than a quirk that should only be cultivated towards pets, brought another aspect into play. The prince was regarded as an idealist and moralist who had no sympathy for actions that he considered morally reprehensible. Not even when it was a matter of life and death. A high intention. An impossible resolution. But one had to admit that Ulan Mestre had proven himself to be reliable and noble in the past. Even unselfish, as his enemies confirmed. Nevertheless. Sooner or later, every idealist came up against his limits. Brooks tried to imagine what the prince would really do if the existence of his people were at stake. It was difficult to say what he would decide then. Zurak, on the other hand, was prepared to use any means to defend his race, which earned him a great deal of approval among his own kind. However, his father was not indifferent to how he was judged in the history books. He also considered the opinions of his subjects to be of a rather subordinate nature. According to Zurak, however, history and the respective assessment of a person were subject to change anyway, which he described as compliant. Depending on the respective fashion and the prevailing culture. Ideals were subject to fluctuations that justified very different courses of action. He did not believe in constant values. It was no secret that he thought his father was a nostalgic and blamed him for the setbacks of the past years as a failure. Ulan Mestre adhered to the established conventions that were generally regarded as the will of the Ten Legates. Until now, he had been able to attribute his actions to their will. It was thanks to this aspect that his critics were still in check. Mestre would not be happy about the research laboratories on Barathon, whose existence he certainly could not reconcile with the will of the Legates. However, Brooks had also formed his own opinion about the so-called will of the Ten Legates and their conventions. For him, they resembled the gods of antiquity, who were somehow present and exhorted their worshippers to good deeds and moderation. At the same time, however, they displayed a crude morality that was impossible to make sense of, or made you lose your mind if you tried to make sense of it. Muduru was also afraid of displeasing the ten legates. But he needed more successes now to get his head out of the noose. He had to show something if he wanted to win the prince's favor and get him to forget the Barathon affair as quickly as possible. However, the legate's laws usually got in the way of quick results. Quick solutions were almost always the wrong ones. Muduru was running out of time. 
Brooks could literally see the Akato's mind working. He knew Morak Maduro better than he thought possible. When Maduro decided to follow the prince's orders and monitor Zurak's actions, the Akato had quickly realized how little he shared the prince's idealism and how much sympathy he had for Zurak's motives. Muduru had shown great willingness to save his people, no matter what laws he had to break. He was willing to support Zurak in whatever he was up to. Brooks had always assumed that he had a strong sense of ethics. However, he had to admit to himself that his attitude had also been damaged and that he had a greater affinity for compromise than he thought possible especially as he knew that the Kimon were becoming more and more powerful and were putting more pressure on the Akato than had previously been the case. He was also amazed at how little disgust he felt for himself in all of this. Surely it was because a Kimon victory would also have terrible consequences for humanity. That was why the fate of individuals was irrelevant, Brooks told himself. The dicey situation had given Zurak a reason to make the decision to create an army of ruthless, merciless killer creatures with which he planned to reconquer one world after another. He had started with Barathan. He had even managed to keep the breeding facility for these creatures, which bore the name Resker, running while the Kimon occupied the planet. After all, it was to Zurak's credit that the Gothrex had proved useful and had killed many Kimon on Barathan. The plan behind the attack on Barathan was to collect them, put them in transport ships and deploy them on Burich. In the end, Zurak would have returned two worlds to his father instead of just one. Zurak would gain favor with his father, who didn't think much of him so far. At least far less than his younger brother Gorak, who was hardly any different in character from Zurak. Except for his talent for putting himself in a better light with his father and the people. Nevertheless, Ulan Mestre was too lenient towards his offspring, which did more damage to his position than he wanted to admit. The Akato were no longer prepared to accept every disaster Zurak and Gorak caused and also blame their father for the many failures for which they were responsible. How do we get Zurak out of there without getting his father involved? Brooks mused aloud, watching every movement on Maduru's face. The Akato turned for a moment to the strategic hologram hovering in the center of the bridge. That won't be possible to prevent. He'll be wondering why we haven't reached Burridge yet anyway. A few new lines of text appeared, which Maduro read casually. We keep getting requests, but I've issued radio silence. Sooner or later, though, I'll have to reply. How about a commando operation? Brooks suggested. A couple of bold soldiers that we drop on Resker. Too risky. I don't mean the landing. We could advance quickly and unmolested. The sky above the island is largely free of enemy units. But evacuating and then gaining distance? He put his finger to his chin. That's where I see the problems. The Kimon will be on our tail very quickly. Then we'll just have to advance with the whole fleet and force Zurak's escape by any means necessary. Muduru looked at Brooks aghast. We would be surrounded and suffer losses without number. Isn't the prince's son worth risking everything for? Even if only one ship that Zurak has on board escapes in the end? Muduru studied the symbols on the strategic hologram. He could see a thousand silent curses escaping his pursed lips. The flicker in his dark eyes betrayed his annoyance. Muduru was suffering more and more from being forced into the role of overseer instead of filling the position of commander that much Brooks knew about the Akato. But strictly speaking, the former was Muduru's real job and he should be aware of that. Nevertheless, it was a fact that the very tasks that were considered simple often turned out to be a surprising burden. Especially when there was no sign of progress. Brooks saw how difficult it was for Maduru to make a decision that might save Zurak, but could seal the fate of the entire fleet. The Serwan reaffirmed once again how necessary it was to do everything in his power to bring Zurak back. If the prince shows up here, Brooks remarked, it would be advantageous if we had his son with us. Do you think I'm not aware of that? rumbled Maduru, whose nerves were on edge. Brooks didn't let up. He had an idea. A risky idea, but it was the best option they had in view of their immense losses. If we were to advance with just a small transporter, he explained, there would be a possibility. It would be attacked and destroyed shortly after its arrival, Maduru contradicted. 
Yes, but certainly not from the entire Kimon fleet. No transporter justifies the deployment of an entire battle group. That could make the Kimon suspicious, the Admiral objected. In any case, I would be surprised if a single, lightly armed vehicle dared to enter my territory. Brooks was not surprised by the timid attitude of the Admiral, who otherwise had a penchant for risky maneuvers. That's right, of course. Every move needs a bit of luck. I'm not telling you anything new. But still, you wouldn't use heavy artillery against a transporter, would you? I would send scouts first. But not a battleship. Not a battleship, confirmed the Akato. I'm betting that the Kimon will also refrain from doing so. If we can hold out long enough to get Zurak on board, I see a chance. The transporter's shield system would have to be reinforced to withstand sustained fire, but their technicians should be able to manage that. That could be done by neglecting other systems, such as life support or weaponry. He laughed contemptuously. How do you envisage that? we'd be sending an empty hull. But one with extremely hard armor. Armor that can take a beating. And that's all you need to ask of it. Muduro rubbed his chin, but it was obvious that he seemed to be enjoying himself. Acceleration is a problem, muttered Muduro. The pressure absorbers eat up almost 30% of the energy. But without gravimetric dampers, we turn the passengers into mush. Brooks already had a veritable idea of how the engineers could accomplish the conversion. I have a few cues to get the engineers on the right track. Transportable habitat chambers that have their own damping system and spacesuits, just in case. Apart from the pilot's area, we could switch off all life support systems. You're right. The gravimetric damping field eats up the most energy, but if we anchor the chambers firmly, the field won't even have to worry about holding them in place. We could then channel the saved energy into the weapons and shields. I'm sure we can get Zurak and present him to his father unharmed. Muduru nodded understandingly and grinned broadly. Now I realize why they call you Jurgen. Your mind is as sharp as a sharpened blade. A pity. I now have the certainty that your backward planet will become the grave of many clever minds. The words hit Brooks hard, even if Muduru, with his awkward praise, had perhaps not meant it quite so badly. The fleet should join the command as soon as Zurak is on board, Brooks continued, and secure the departure. Then it's just a matter of getting out of the system quickly before they encircle us. I'm putting together a crew for the transporter, the Akado said with an approving nod. I have some daring pilots and gunners for a Chikuro like this. He stirred his hand in the air as he searched for the right word. Enterprise, Serwan Brooks came to his aid. Huzar's play, Muduru corrected, the horse-headed admiral's lips pursing with relish as if he intended to kiss Brooks. Brooks was amused by the sometimes quirky nature of Muduru, who was one of the oldest Akado he knew. Although his three hundred years on earth did not yet make him an old man by Askarun's standards. However, one should not fall into the error of thinking that he was an Akado of the more good-natured variety. He had no scruples about getting his way and could literally walk over dead bodies. Serwan Brooks had often witnessed this trait. Muduru did everything he could to protect the eldest son of House Mestre, and could be ruthless if someone became a danger to Ulan Mestre's offspring. With Zurak himself, however, he reached his limits, which this time caused him more trouble than usual. If the mission failed, he could drag Brooks down with him. You and your servants, Muduru said quietly. You will accompany the mission. Brooks couldn't hide his surprise. Is that necessary? I don't see how we could be useful. We're not fighters. Then it's time for you to learn. The Serwan knew why Maduro had come up with this idea. If the mission failed, he was the only one who knew about Resker and the Gothrex. However, Brooks dared to doubt whether Maduro would save his life. The whole Barathan operation could be considered a betrayal, and from that point of view, Muduru's head was sitting very loosely on his neck right now. The Chikuro started earlier than Brooks would have liked. In spite of everything, the Akado made a mighty effort to save their master, who had put them in this predicament after all. Quicker than expected, the Serwan and his two assistants found themselves in the cockpit of a transporter, where the Akados hurried to prepare for departure. 
The seats were adjusted to the Akato's height. But the upholstery of the pilot's seats was adjustable and could be adapted to human proportions. Brooks and his assistants were busy making themselves as comfortable as possible until the press fields began to work and the crew squeezed into their seats. The engine started up and the four Akatopilots initiated the departure maneuver. Miran Sakov and Norman Bronstein, who were sitting next to Brooks, were pale and the stress was evident on their faces. It was the first time they had been in a combat zone without the protection of a fleet unit and in danger of coming face to face with the enemy. Never before had they had to go to the front line. The fact that the prince's son had found himself in this situation had to be blamed on the miscalculation on which the offensive was based. Sakov seemed to be struggling to keep his breakfast down, and so did Bronstein. Brooks, however, was too preoccupied with his own thoughts to formulate words to encourage them and scare away their fear. He had enough to do fighting his own fear. At least Bronstein tried to distract himself by studying the displays on his console and calling up data showing a detailed scan of the star system. The display flickered above the projector field and showed Barathan as a tiny blue marble surrounded by small red dots. The Kimon. Brooks watched as his assistant analyzed the hologram and deleted irrelevant data from the display. What remained were ten large battleships in low orbit over the planet's continents. They secured the mine complexes that had been taken over by the bugs. Are there any radio signals? asked Brooks. Bronstein looked over the co-pilot's backrest and compared the readings on his monitor with those on his own display. He shook his head. The sensors are switched on. But I'm not picking up anything. Not a single signal from our units. I can't make out any of the partisan frequencies either. Until a few months ago, there had still been scattered Akato units that, together with the remaining inhabitants of Barathan, had been attacking the Kimon. Contact had now been broken off completely. Muduru had assumed that there were no Akato left on Barathan, which had survived the Kimon attack ten years ago and which had wiped out the majority of the population. But perhaps the Kimon saw things differently, Brooks thought. The number of battleships was too large, even if you subtracted the part of the fleet that had appeared after the Akato had arrived. The insectoids seemed to be concerned with far more than protecting the five mining facilities they had taken over. Five blades had descended on the mines in order to extract the mineral resources the Kimon way. The blades alone represented a sizable contingent of fortifications, easily capable of protecting the territory around the mining areas. The transporter floated out of the hangar, sat in front of the Jaber's bow and accelerated. The speed increased. The speed was impressive for a transporter. At least the engineers had managed that, Brooks thought. It remained to be seen whether they were just as adept at converting the other systems. A halo jump, Sokov remarked, his pale face looking a touch paler. From a height of four light seconds. If we're ever going to have a combat mission, he swallowed the lump in his throat with difficulty, then let's do it properly. One of the Akato turned to Sokov. We'll take care of you Z Skuru, you little brat. The Kimon aren't moving, Bronstein informed them as they rushed towards the planet. They haven't noticed us yet. The Kimon did not leave their positions even when the transporter hit the Barathan stratosphere and reduced its speed. By now, the small ship must have been recognizable on the enemy sensors. The co-pilot pointed to some symbols that suddenly appeared in his hollow. Muko Duri Kimon, he grunted contemptuously and his colleague at the controls replied with a snort. Brooks heard the engines power down and energy being channeled into the shields. The atmospheric layers crashed against the energy hull surrounding the transporter. The normally invisible force fields began to glow in all colors, like the cold glow of the northern lights. In contrast, the black of the sea beneath the transporter stretched out in all directions. In the midst of this endless mass of water, on which they shot down like a meteor, a single rock loomed, the surf foaming up on its shore. Bronstein pointed to three red markers approaching their position. Now we have a visitor. Brostein seemed more composed than his colleague, who had now fallen completely silent and was clutching his arm pads. As soon as Bronstein had spoken, the alarm sounded and new markings flashed up on the co-pilot's hollow. 
they appeared near the fleet, which was now several light seconds behind them. The subspace scan registered five large objects materializing in normal space. This was followed by another five and finally two more, which appeared close to the Jaber. Brooks held his breath as he stared at the markings and the transporter plunged toward the ocean. Chapter 6 Dominic had a bad feeling when he returned to the base in the evening. The troops had made themselves comfortable in one of the workshop halls. Doc Warden was tending to the wounded lying on the floor, covered by isolation mats. Dominic saw Longhill and some of his men who had gone into the tunnels with Stephanie and had now returned. However, without Stephanie and a few others, whose absence now made the troop of tunnel rats and snowcats seem tiny. About forty men were here right now, including the wounded. He had to find out what had happened in the meantime and where his comrade and the rest of the tunnel rats had gone. Longhill and his former officers were sitting under the archway of the hall around a warming light that glowed like a small bonfire as Dominic approached. Where's Stephanie? asked Dominic. He was excited and his tone was perhaps too brash. We're not their menders, Ableton replied, but Longhill didn't seem interested in getting into an argument and raised his hand placatingly. We don't know what's wrong with her, Longhill said in a calm tone. She'll fight like the others who are still with her. What's down there that's so important to Zurak? He couldn't contain the anger in his voice. Cleese pulled up and got so close to Dominic that their noses were almost touching and the man's breath hit him in the face. That's not a topic for a nice evening, he whispered. Sounds exciting, Dominic replied. I like exciting stories. Longhill remained calm. Sit down with us, Porter. Dominic hesitated. He didn't particularly like any of the three men and didn't value their company. Don't act like an offended asshole, Longhill continued. I don't like to look up at anyone when I'm talking. So if you want to know something, pull yourself together. Cleese sat down again and Dominic also took a seat next to Longhill. He studied the faces of the three as if he could read the events of the last few hours in them. So, he began again. What about Stephanie? Nothing, replied the former captain. We were sent back, she went on with the rest of the squad. There was no further combat. No fighting. So you have nothing to worry about. Dominic wished he was a little more reassured, but that wasn't the case. The Kimon, or rather the Skelks, didn't worry him. You would be able to deal with them. It was the Akados that scared him especially Zero Donna, with her talk of supernatural abilities among the humans. It was the existence of the base, which apparently nobody but Zurak and his confidants knew about. There was a certain threat in all of this that Dominic could not grasp. What is your impression of our situation? He asked Longhill, whose assessment he wanted to hear. None, said Longhill. And that's what scares me. We are not in enemy territory. We're in a place far from civilization, in the middle of nowhere, far from the eyes of the enemy. An uninteresting piece of rock, and yet you get the impression that you're not safe. Do you feel the same way? I feel very safe, Dominic lied. He didn't feel the urge to discuss his feelings with Longhill. Really? We have enough supplies and are undetected. And the Kimon asked Longhill in a way that suggested he had already drawn his conclusions. Who dropped them off here? In the middle of the ocean like this. Did they swim? Dominic's silence was answer enough. Longhill knew he was asking himself the same questions. All right, said Longhill. You want to know what we've discovered here? That's why I came to you. The facility here is not a battle station, he explained. There's nothing here that could be used to launch an attack. Then what is it? No idea. Maybe a military hospital. A shelter. A research station. But that's also speculation. Like I said before. The situation is unclear. Longhill looked out over the sea and its dark horizon. The sooner we get out of here, the better. Isn't Adam Hunt working on that right now? The former officers exchanged astonished glances. Secrecy isn't exactly your thing, Dominic scoffed. At the moment, 
Miles is in charge here, Long Hill defended himself. He's good, but I would never take him into my confidence. He's a buddy to all the soldiers and that's not compatible with a higher rank. That's why you're such a good officer. Cleese laughed, but quickly regained his composure. Long Hill was not in a joking mood. Don't get cheeky, kid. What do you know about it? Enough, Dominic almost replied. I know very well. And especially about how, as an officer, you have to keep your mouth shut if you have a clue. Back to the subject, growled Longhill. I'd like to send you on a secret mission to your two buddies. To Davis and Skorsky. I'm getting the impression more and more that the Akato are playing a double game with us. And I'm sure your buddies know all about it. Davis and Skorsky might be aware of the Akato's intentions, but they wouldn't tell me anything. I'm no longer under your command, Dominic replied. And if I want to find out something, I'll do it for personal reasons. I thought you were ready for a quit pro quo, Longhill said disappointedly. This is everyone's business and we shouldn't keep sensitive information to ourselves. If you can get anything from Davis and Skorsky about Zurak's motives, I need to know. They don't tell me much about their past, Dominic confessed and looked around for the two of them. They're on a tour, Cleese informed us, pointing downwards. Cleaning up a few corners with their comrades. Don't think they'll be back soon. There are no more Skelk here who could be dangerous to us, Dominic said, but then paused for a moment. Except for those who are deep down. Longhill exchanged a few glances with his friends, which Dominic was unable to interpret. Did they know about the Skelks? Or was this information new to them? That's what fuels my suspicion of Davis and Skorsky, Longhill said. They managed to make sure none of the Snowcats went with Zurak. Except for Dormer. She was too out of her depth. And you, Porter. You were out of action. But my people, they took them and then sent us back with a few others. I have a suspicion that your two buddies have at least some idea of what the horseheads are doing here. At that moment, Zurak returned accompanied by his fellow Akaders, but without the guardsmen who had gone with him. Dominic felt hot and cold down his spine. He jumped up and hurried towards Zurak. What about Stephanie? He asked Akato without greeting him or giving his voice a suitably reverent tone. And what about the other comrades? One of the horseheads jumped forward and stood in front of Dominic, ready to send him to the ground with a punch. Zurak, however, grabbed the soldier by the shoulder and stopped him from harming the human. Your comrades have a task. The reply from Zurak's mouth was a single, menacing rumble. They will protect us and fulfill their duty. That was the end of Akato's explanations and he pushed past Dominic. Zero Donna gave Dominic a long look and smiled wryly. From the look on her face, he thought she had found the clear-sighted one, or rather the Shikaka, the clear-sighted one, and Stephanie. Dominic had probably dropped out of her field of vision as a result. An advantage, but it didn't make him feel any better. He was afraid to question the Akata woman any further. Did he not want to arouse her anger or was he just afraid of unpleasant, disturbing revelations? Shortly afterwards, Davis and Skorsky returned from their tour with some of the snowcats. Dominic hurried towards them, who looked at him with astonished faces. Something's happened to Stephanie, Dominic burst out. She went off with a squad and... We know that, Davis interrupted. Isn't she back yet? No. And not her companions either. Not all of them, anyway. Kelman muttered a curse. Then we'll have to look for her. Yes, the snowcats replied as if from one mouth. Park, Leach, and Tina Bowers loaded their rifles in confirmation and punctuated the whole thing with a series of curses and imprecations about Kimon and Skelks. Take it easy, Davis reassured her. We'll first find out exactly what happened. If anything happened at all. Our nerves are frazzled and most of us haven't slept for hours. It's easy to worry more than necessary. I don't like it. Dominic had to succeed in making it clear to Davis that they had no time to lose. There are still 31 Skelks on the lower floors. I can feel them. Why are they still alive? Why are Stephanie and the others with the monsters without finishing them off? 
They could have done that long ago. That sounds strange, Gardner said. And only Zurak came back with his Akados. We'll calm down for now, Davis rebutted. Don't make any rash moves now. The atmosphere is already tense enough. Dominic would have liked to ask Davis what he knew about these or similar bunkers in front of the snowcats. But Davis was right. The tension was high enough and didn't need any additional explosives. Dominic tried a different tactic. I don't think we're dealing with a troop base here, said Dominic, studying the emotions on Davis's face. But he had himself well under control. Davis put his fists on his hips. Do they already know the Akato military facilities well enough to judge that? No, Doming thought to herself, but you did. That's why I'm asking and you're avoiding me. So I'm right in my assessment. You know exactly what's going on. Do we have here one of the reasons why you turned your back on the Akato? And why did you come back? At least Davis refrained from contradicting him directly and claiming that he was worrying unnecessarily. That would have been implausible. There were quite a few people who knew that something was wrong here and some of them had spent enough time under the Akato to make a guess. Nevertheless, Dominic wasn't going to let Davis off that easily. I'd just like to know your assessment, he insisted. Davis gave Dominic a long, penetrating look. All right, then. But I'm warning you. Clear answers often cause more problems than open questions. Whatever Davis had wanted to reveal, he never got around to it. Suddenly, a roar filled the air, bouncing off the bunker walls dozens of times. Outside the dock, bright searchlights scanned the air, forming circular patches of light that danced on the gray-green sea. A ship sank down and began to hover a few meters above the surface as its engines churned the ocean. A large troop carrier, from which a small module was now detached and able to enter the hangar. Come on, asked David Steinberg. The rescue team, corrected Dora Foster. But the Kimon won't be long in coming, Skorsky remarked succinctly. Let's make sure we get away. What about Stephanie? Dominic wanted to know. We can't leave her here. He noticed that the snowcat's willingness to look for their comrade had just dropped considerably. The soldiers looked at each other. They looked indecisive and ashamed. That's out of our hands now, Davis said as the small box-shaped module approached. Dominic was torn between his own rescue and the search for his comrade. He was wondering whether he should just set off to find Stephanie when the safety catch on Skorsky's rifle clicked. I can understand you, kid, said the man. But I can't let you get lost or do something stupid that we'll all have to pay for. You haven't lost Stephanie, said Davis, grabbing Dominic by the shoulder and pulling him towards him. And yes, we know about these facilities. Pavel and I came with you to save you all. But you have to trust us. Dominic's mistrust had not disappeared as a result. His already existing confusion increased significantly. Some answers were actually more problematic than open questions. At the moment, he no longer trusted anyone. The remaining tunnel rats and Akato left the hall to board the small modular boat that was just touching down at the pier. The wounded were hurriedly carried out of the hall as best they could without suitable transportation equipment. Some moaned in pain as their comrades dragged them out between them. A hatch opened on the side of the box-shaped vehicle so that Zurak could get his soldiers in. Skorsky jabbed the muzzle of his rifle into Dominic's side. And now it's our turn. Move out, he growled. Now. Dominic reluctantly obeyed. We'll definitely be back, Tina Bowers reassured them. Then we'll get Stephanie. Dominic couldn't share her optimism. When would that be? When would Zurak come here again, and did he even want to take his guardsmen with him? The prince's son would certainly have preferred that they had never seen this complex. Dominic thought it impossible that they would ever see this place and their comrades again. The soldiers carried the wounded on board and Serwan Brooks appeared in the access bulkhead to make sure that his master was all right. But he seemed less pleased by the appearance of Serwan and his two assistants than he might have thought. The Akato grunted at him with harsh-sounding words in the Akato language, the bitterness of which was evident on Brooke's face. He bowed his head, offended and humiliated, and let the rebuke wash over him. 
the bulkhead had barely been closed when the vehicle whirled around and shot off with its engines howling. The soldiers stood close together, gasping for air. The situation must have been unbearable for the wounded lying on the ground here and there. Held by a comrade, a man stood next to Dominic on unsteady legs. Doc Warden had had to amputate one of his arms. The lower part of the bandage wrapped around the stump was deep red and released an incessant stream of blood that soon formed a slippery puddle on the floor. We have to change planes, Brooks informed the passengers. The ride will be unpleasant, but we've done everything we can to ensure your safety. The bulkhead then opened again, revealing the interior of a large transporter. Please don't argue. Just follow our instructions so that we can take off. A vibration went through the ship. The shield system crackled, but was able to absorb the blow without further ado. Brooks pointed out into the cargo hold, where there were a number of containers that looked like escape pods but were firmly attached to the floor. Some of them were the size to hold an Akato, but most of them seemed to be designed for humans. They are safe inside, the Serwan continued. They are equipped with a cushioning system and have their own life support in case the hull is damaged and atmosphere escapes. Please hurry. We can't take off until you're all inside. The troops began to move and Roderick Miles, who had obviously been the first to understand the purpose of this action, began to organize the soldiers. He made sure that the wounded were not harmed any further in the process and grabbed hold wherever he could help. Dominic was convinced that Brooks also knew about the secret island. He grabbed the Serwan by the wrist. We have to go back, he said. Right away. You know what kind of place this is. Am I right? Comrades are still there. Are you mad, soldier? growled the Serwan, wriggling out of Dominic's grip. Bronstein and Sakov were on hand to stop Dominic from harassing Brooks any further. Tell me what this is. Dominic insisted. You know what it is, don't you? My girlfriend is trapped there and thirty others. Make sure you get into the chamber. The Serwin's two assistants pushed Dominic towards one of the pods as a hail of bullets rained down on the ship, which was now beginning to sway. It was all the same to Dominic. He was still on the island in his mind, trying to find Stephanie. He knew from the conversation he had had with Zero Odana on the Jitta that the Akato had plans for the humans they accepted into their ranks. Of course, Dominic did not know to what extent it was permitted to harm these people. But he had no doubt that the health of an earthling was one of the factors that the Akato would neglect when it came to their advantage. Ulan Mestre had to know about it, that much was clear to Dominic. The fear of the Ten Legates would certainly prompt him to get to the bottom of things. He decided to do everything in his power to meet the prince again and inform him of his son's machinations. Chapter 7 Dominic staggered dazedly out of the capsule. The damping field had undoubtedly been adjusted to the proportions and weight of a full-grown Akato. In any case, it had pressed Dominic so firmly into the seat that he found it difficult to breathe. His body ached as if he had been caught in a scrap metal press. It was a miracle that none of his bones were broken. His comrades seemed to be no different, as they staggered, rubbed their arms and shoulders or lay on the floor gasping for breath. The transporter had landed in one of the large warships and was now standing in its huge hangar. Serwan Brooks was just leaving the transporter with Zurak and his officers. But while the Akados hurried away, Brooks waited in the hangar for the guardsmen to come out of the transporter. It could have been his imagination but Dominic thought Brooks was watching him. In any case, he seemed to be keeping a close eye on him as his comrades lined up in front of him. May we know what's going on, a soldier coughed. Were you planning to save us only to kill us personally? Brooks waited until the guardsmen had recovered from the exertions of the short but strenuous journey and he had the soldier's attention. We've received support, explained Brooks. Hulan Mestre himself is here, leading the attack. The Kimon are in retreat at the moment. None of the guardsmen showed any signs of rejoicing. That probably meant they would have to get ready to fight again and follow Zurak into battle once more. Dominic, however, had a different feeling. Exactly what he had feared had happened and could lead to a rift between the prince and his son. This development meant serious difficulties and could have unpleasant consequences for the guardsmen. 
Dominic was certainly not alone in this fear. The Jaber and the escort units will remain in their positions and not intervene in the fighting. Brooks folded his arms behind his back. That goes for all units under Zurak and Maduru's command. We are to wait for further orders. Until then, stay in your shelters. In other words, Zurak and his men were under arrest, Dominic thought. And as if to emphasize his suspicions, Dominic could see a ship approaching through the huge hangar bulkhead, dropping off fighter units and a shuttle. The large craft floated towards the open bulkhead and landed in the hangar. The Akato hangar crew put down their weapons, sat down on the floor and crossed their hands over their heads. Put your weapons on the ground, Serwan Brooks ordered. Do as the Akato do, and please don't do anything stupid. He leaned down to Dominic and spoke so quietly that only he could hear the Serwan. Prick up your ears and draw your conclusions. Maybe it will make it easier for you later. Dominic couldn't make heads or tails of the Serwan's enigmatic words, who turned away and focused his attention on what was happening in the hangar. Shortly afterwards, the sides of the ferry opened. Akato soldiers in the prince's green and gold uniform poured out and secured the Jaber's cargo bay while more boarding ships arrived. An Akato officer approached at a leisurely pace and greeted the Serwan with a barely perceptible nod of his head. Serwan Brooks, he said with an expressionless expression. His sonorous voice was clearly audible through the noise. General Ito. Good to see you, Brooks replied and left it at these brief words of welcome. Zurak will have a lot of explaining to do. This undertaking here requires powerful arguments to soften the prince's anger. I'm aware of that. Why didn't you tell the prince about this? It all happened very quickly and Zurak doesn't tell me half as much about his plans as the prince suspects. It's not the first time Zurak has embarrassed us, as I'm sure you know. You mean to tell me, the Akato continued incredulously, that Jurgen the dagger has become blunt. Not that, Brooks replied quickly. But the capriciousness of the prince's son defies all judgment. On the other hand, Ulan Mestre is a stickler for facts and doesn't want to be constantly pestered for bold predictions. That is why I am holding back with premature warnings. But this operation can also be interpreted as spontaneous folly. Other facts, however, are of a more piquant nature and require planning that cannot simply be dismissed as an oversight. The prince will certainly be interested in them. The Akato officer looked first at the Serwan and then at the guardsmen, who were crouching on the ground and looking perplexed. Meanwhile, the boarding boats disgorged rows upon rows of soldiers who set about taking over the Jaber. The roar of their boots filled the ship. The facts will have to wait for the time being, said General Ido. Your people are now in custody and will be placed under arrest in their quarters until we have uncovered whether this is treason. In any case, it's stupidity, as I said before. I didn't say that traitors always have to be clever. And if stupidity turns someone into a traitor, I'll be the first to vote to free the poor creature from its stupid skull. Nobody is being called a traitor here yet. We'll see what Ulan Mestre has to say about it. For now, take the guardsmen to their quarters. You will be personally liable to me for their whereabouts. I want you and your soldiers to be available to me for questioning at any time. Brooks obeyed and led the humans to their quarters. They walked past rows of cowering Akato, guarded by their own kind. Here and there, one of the prisoners was being bludgeoned by the butts of rifles, but most of them remained motionless and distraught on the ground. In the meantime, Dominic recapitulated the scene he had just witnessed between Brooks and Ito. Apparently, Serwan Brooks did not seem to be affected by the restrictive measures Ito had imposed on the crew and was allowed to move around freely. He did not have to cower on the ground like the guardsmen, nor was he snarled at or threatened with weapons like the rest of the crew. The conversation between Ito and Brooks seemed to suggest that the Serwan was subordinate to the prince and acted as an overseer for Zurak. Or as an informant for Zurak's father. As Brooks had asked Dominic to do, he had pricked up his ears and drawn his conclusions, but this only complicated matters further. Apparently there was no one who wasn't somehow playing a double game. Except Longhill and his officers, who were of an almost soldierly simplicity. At that moment, Dominic felt sympathy for the former captain. 
he was unpleasant in his manner, but with him there would be no surprises that revealed any abysses or shady intentions. In their cramped quarters, Dominic fell into a depressive mood. Stephanie's cot above him was empty. Her voice was inaudible while Gardner, Bowers, Leach, and Kelman talked. It was an animated discussion, full of speculation about what she might expect. There was surprisingly little talk of Stephanie. Dominic didn't know whether to be angry or happy about it. After a few minutes, however, all but Kelman had decided to catch up on some sleep and bowed out of the conversation, leaving only Kelman, who couldn't keep his mouth shut. He complained bitterly about the whole situation and especially about being cooped up in their cramped quarters until it became too much for Bowers. You're whining like an old woman, she said succinctly and rolled over to the wall. Have you ever been substituted even though it wasn't your fault, he replied. Just because someone thinks it's better for the team? When you're hanging around on the bench while you watch the others get the win? Or how the team gets disqualified and you couldn't do anything about it? Probably happened to you a lot, Gardner remarked. Oh, screw you all. I'd love to, muttered Bowers. If you'll just shut up. Dominic only listened with half an ear. His thoughts were still on the island and he came to the realization that he should be grateful to Kelman for his self-pity. After all, he was drawing all the attention to himself and so no one was talking about Stephanie. For Dominic, his own thoughts were painful enough. He didn't really need a conversation about her fate. Perhaps his comrades instinctively sensed that a discussion about the last few hours would have been pointless and upsetting. Judging by what Zurak had said, she wasn't dead. Assuming the Akato wasn't speaking in riddles to describe Stephanie's loss. Zero Donna would certainly not have been in such a good mood if something had happened to Stephanie, whom she considered exceptional and with whom she had plans. Suddenly, the door opened and Miran Sakov entered. Without a polite word of greeting, he immediately turned to Dominic. Come with me, Porter, he ordered and followed up when Dominic didn't jump off his cot straight away. Are you listening hard? Come with me. Now. He spoke unusually loudly. Apparently to impress the Akato guards who were keeping an eye on the guardsmen's quarters and their occupants. Am I going to get shot now? Joked Dominic and began to lace up his boots. Questioning, explained the young Sirwan. The others will have their turn too. You don't say, Kelman commented with mock astonishment. What about the promised medals and the wives? Or the crunchy boys, added Tina Bowers. Hurry up, Porter, urged Sakov. We don't have time. Dominic was surprised by this remark. Why should anyone be in a hurry now? The battle was still going on and the interrogations could certainly wait. There were only four posts ready to guard the large hangar in which the human quarters were located. Sakov walked with long strides, trying to make an important impression. It took them a while to reach Brooks' quarters. Sakov flicked a switch and after a few moments the door opened. Sakov and Porter entered and found only Brooks sitting on the edge of his desk, already waiting for them. He was twirling a short dagger in his fingers, which he now put aside. No Akato here to take me apart, asked Dominic half-jokingly. He had expected to be heard by one of the horseheads. I have a proposal to make to you, the Serwan opened. Bronstein is in the process of getting a ship ready for takeoff under false pretenses. I don't know how long we have before the hoax is discovered. That's why I need a quick answer. Where should we flee to? Dominic wondered. To Earth? You joker. Brooks laughed softly. Back to Barathon. You know the facility there. That was clear to me. I knew they existed. Brooks stood up and came closer. But not where she was exactly until I made suggestions for a rescue mission. It would be good to thumb our noses at the prince that his son is keeping secrets from him. That might give us a bonus. In any case, things will come to light, which will also be useful to us. Can I count on you? I still don't know what's being done there. And what you're planning. I mean, how you want to proceed to get things rolling. Isn't that your intention or am I wrong? I need more information. Information? Brooks puts his fists on his hips. Stealing the ship. 
return to the island. Raise dust. Wait to see what happens. That's all there is to say. I want to know what's being done there. Dominic insisted. Brooks hesitated, but it seemed advisable to reveal a few details. The Gothrex are hybrid beings. Bred from Skelks and humans. They ensure that Barathan has never been completely taken over by the Kimon. Dominic felt his eyes go black. He had expected anything, but not such a shocking revelation. He found it difficult to formulate words. And you know about this? Brooks was silent for a few moments. Yes. I know a lot about it. Ulan Mestre too? No. Why didn't you tell him? I'm sure he doesn't agree with it. It was clear to Brooks that he was not really inclined to discuss the matter. The prince is blind to difficult family matters. I'm almost glad it's now become a problem for all Akados. That is, if we make it so now. Then Mestre won't be able to look the other way. So. He fixed Dominic insistently. Are you with me? He didn't have to think twice. Yes, that's me. We'll send for their comrades, Brooks informed them further. What do they call themselves? Snowcats? He shook his head in amusement. Don't tell them anything. Let them think they're getting their fur pulled over their ears. Then the Akados won't suspect we're up to something. You know the snow cats? Sokov began to recite the names of the small troop. Their adventure on Dostra has spread far and wide. I'm sure it will soon be common reading in Akado children's books. They and their friends will be legends. We'll leave Davis and Skorsky here, Brooks interjected. I don't want them interfering. Why would they do that? I know them both from before, explained the Serwan. Another revelation that surprised Dominic. Where from? Brooks didn't answer his question. Do you want to reconsider now? Do you need them to make you feel safe? If only to find out more about Davis and Skorsky later, he couldn't afford to alienate Brooks. No. We don't need them. But I would have liked to take Longhill with me. And his two former officers. Cleese and Ableton. Oh yes. Doc Warden should be there too. Why do you want them with you? Dominic couldn't give a logical answer to that. It had been more of a feeling, a spontaneous intuition. But when he looked into the causes of this intuition, he could actually find arguments to support his suggestion. Longhill had shown him Syra. That ancient Apony spaceship in the cave on Dostra, and had taken him into his confidence. Even though they had their differences, Dominic felt he owed Longhill a favor and wanted him along for the ride if there was any chance of getting answers to the questions that were bothering them both. Even if he didn't yet know what exactly they might find in the depths of the station and what it ultimately meant. It was important, that much was certain, and Longhill, as the former captain of the squad, would be there when the mystery was solved. With this knowledge, Longhill would return to the center of the troop and soon take over its leadership again. Dominic would much rather do that than submit to the orders of Miles, who filled this position rather reluctantly and sloppily. It was also important to avoid putting Raymond Davis, whom he trusted less and less, in the boss's chair. I think Longhill is a good captain, Dominic said curtly. I think he can be trusted. No matter what happens, Longhill will make sure that neither the tunnel rats nor the snowcats overreact. Snowcats, the Serwan muttered to himself. The words still seemed to amuse Brooks. How do the soldiers always come up with names like that? Finally, he took a small black stick, not much bigger than a pencil, from the breast pocket of his uniform and handed it to Dominic. This is a master key, explained the Serwan. If a door is locked, you can open it with this thing. Dominic took the key and slipped it into the inside pocket of his uniform jacket. Feels like the key to Pandora's box. Brooks smiled sympathetically. So what if it is? It's already open. Chapter 8 The Snowcats, Longhill, Cleese, Ableton and the Doctor were picked up by Sokov and taken to one of the ships they had used when they landed on Barathon. Dora Foster immediately disappeared into the cockpit and powered up the engines while Bronstein showed the others where he had deposited some weapons and the light armor. 
They were in the maintenance pit, directly under their feet, where all the ship's important lines and cables ran. What kind of crap is going on here? grumbled Doc Warden. Escapades like this are not for old people like me. You'll get your money's worth, appeased Longhill. You'll be thrilled. Surely the Akato will soon smell a rat, Leech remarked, shaking his head suspiciously. Longhill nodded and Cleese also expressed his skepticism by making a sound that was probably meant to be a laugh. They already have, Sokov confirmed. But we have someone who is still holding back the alarm. Bribery? Kelman wondered. I thought they were all loyal dogs who knew nothing but unquestioning obedience. Damned space samurai who would rather die than let someone down and lose face in the process. You're younger than you look, Kelman, Bronstein mocked. Read more good books. Serwan Brooks has immense powers. Most Akato won't ask questions. But there are always a few who turn out to be danger points for any good plan and turn their heads. You have to appease them. At all times in history, corrupt individuals have been instrumental in the course of. That's enough now, Sokov interrupted irritably. His nerves were more frayed than those of his colleague, who seemed to be in a chatty mood. We can't push our luck any longer. You have to go. The Serwin's two assistants disembarked in the small group, excluding Dominic, took their places in the seats along the side of the ship. The insulation panels held the people in place with a firm, invisible grip and pressed them into the cushions. What have you got us into, Porter? Longhill pressed out. What do you know about Brooke's motives? Nothing, Dominic replied. I thought I'd do you a favor. You wanted some answers. Now you might get them all at once. Dominic rushed into the cockpit as the engine started up to act as co-pilot for Dora. He didn't really care what Longhill's concerns were or whether he felt uncomfortable now. He didn't really care about finding out what secrets Zurak was hiding from his father and what they meant for House Mestre. All that mattered to him was meeting Stephanie again and seeing if she was still alive. About time, Dora grumbled as Dominic entered the pulpit and sat down in the co-pilot's chair. The ship glided slowly out of the hangar. After it had passed the barrier field that sealed the Jaber's hangar airlock from the vacuum, Dora breathed a sigh of relief. Everything's gone well so far. Dominic's thoughts were already further ahead. I can't wait to see what madness we encounter on the island. I'd rather any madness than rot in our quarters while we're being interrogated. She sped up and watched the monitors to see if the ship had been picked up by the homing beacons. The others see it that way too, you can bet on it. Park didn't make a sound the whole time for fear he'd be picked up and tortured. When we got in here, his face got some color back. At least it's less pale than before. Dominic saw the Jaber, together with the Odini, commanded by General Ido, shrink into small dots on one of the screens. Ahead, he could see with the naked eye the individual ships of the fleet hurling fiery salvos at Barathon. Brooks has marked the target point. Dora pointed to a bright spot in the hologram of the planet, above the console. The target area is clear. No units to be seen. Neither ours nor those of the Kimon. The alarm blared and red markings appear on the rear monitor. Now they've seen through the trick, the pilot remarked and increased the speed until the virtual needle on the speed indicator moved into the red zone. The big theater, Dominic said. Exactly what Brooks wanted. Now all eyes were on them. Chapter 9 The island still lay untouched. Dawn was breaking, highlighting the outline of the steep rocky outcrop that dominated the tiny island. A few bright stars were still the only thing to be seen in the sky. The small ship flew into the harbor through the low gate under the rocky outcrop and landed on the pier. Dora Foster ran a scan signal over the area and switched off the engines after she could not make out any enemy units. Without a word, the soldiers put on their light armor and left the ship. Longhill immediately took his place at the head of the troops. You know where we're going? Dominic asked the former captain. That's why I'm here, isn't it? Without responding further to Dominic, Longhill led the soldiers into the central corridor of the station and then down several ramps to the lower floors. Dominic, who was completely unfamiliar with the layout of the facility, 
recognized several elevators, but apparently the captain didn't want to use them. Understandably so, as an attack could come at any moment and paralyze the facility's electrical systems. It was depressing enough descending deeper and deeper into the sparsely lit labyrinth. Every now and then, they passed the carcasses of Sklex and the desiccated corpses of Sumikado, which sent a shiver down Dominic's spine. What frightened him even more, however, were the many containers hanging in neat rows on the walls. Transparent cylinders filled with a shimmering bluish liquid that reminded him strikingly of the cargo containers used by the Fleds. Gradually, Dominic began to fear that the Akado were also in league with the criminals. Zurak knew no scruples, Dominic had already learned that much, and it seemed conceivable to Dominic that he was buying people from the Fleds or employing people himself to supply him with them. Peiko had hinted at something like that when they had been on their tour of the island together. But why was Zurak going to all this trouble? Longhill pointed to a corridor that led steeply downhill. We've already been this far. This is where Zurak sent us back. We've already seen enough, said Park. What's there to see? More corridors and hallways? Then you're welcome to go back on your own, said Tina Bowers. Anyway, I'm curious enough to meet the final boss. I don't want to miss the end of the show. The end of the show. Park growled out the words. It's easy to become a leading man here. At least you don't get a heroic role in it, Dora Foster retorted. Kelman stared at the dark corridor as if a monster could jump out at him at any moment. I'm assuming we're going to have to take out some skelks. I can sense them. Me too, Gardner confirmed. But their signals are weak. I'm not picking up any aggressive impulses. And only a few images. Longhill set off with his three friends. Dominic joined them, even though he had a queasy feeling. The skelks still seemed calm and hadn't moved. They remained in place, beyond the darkness into which the corridor led. The soldiers switched on the lamps that were attached to the barrels of their rifles and illuminated the field of fire. They passed through a few more large rooms until finally a heavy armored bulkhead became visible, blocking their way. End of the line, said Park, but he certainly meant that they should turn back as quickly as possible. Ableton examined the switches and buttons on the frame of the armored door. He pressed one or two of them, but without any effect. How are we supposed to get this thing open? I don't see any way. The console switches aren't responding. Zurak would be pretty stupid, Cleese confirmed, if he left the door to the inner sanctum unlocked. You could have guessed that. Longhill looked at Dominic expectantly. You must have thought of that, right? Brooks had thought of this, Dominic had to admit, and pulled the master key out of his jacket. Wordlessly, he approached the door and searched for a while for the right opening in the frame of the bulkhead. Once he had found it, he inserted the key and was rewarded with a low humming sound as the door mechanism activated. A horizontal gap became visible and widened. As one part of the bulkhead slid upwards and the other downwards, lights flashed behind the door. They revealed the interior of a huge hall, larger than any they had ever seen before. To Dominic's horror, hundreds of containers were lined up here. Naked human bodies were floating in some of them. Looks like we found our predecessors, Kelman whispered, but in the silence his words sounded like gunshots. I bet they're the guardsmen we relieved. Longhill walked on and the snowcats followed until they reached a place that was brightly lit. Beams of light fell from above onto a number of glass cylinders in which they recognized some of their comrades. Fields, Baker, Mifune, Krinner. Longhill pointed to his men in the transparent tanks and called more names. What the hell is happening here? Doc Warden quickly made sense of it and pointed to some equipment hanging from the ceiling. These are gene splicers, he explained. You can use them to separate, subdivide, and split the DNA strand. The Akato must have stolen them from Earth. He approached one of the tanks and followed the course of several hoses and cables that stretched across the ceiling like a bizarre tangle of gnarled climbing plants. What's your impression? Longhill wanted to know. What have we got here? Doc Warden hesitated with an assessment. I'll have to look around a bit. But I've seen something similar before. In connection with the Genetic Loom Project. So? 
that was banned at the time. The Koreans pursued some promising approaches until the United Nations intervened. The working title was True Gods. Cleese also had some information on this. The Frankenstein Syndicate was another name. Unofficial. But more accurate. Doc Warden nodded silently as he spotted larger tanks containing skelks. I think they're weaving together genetic information to create something new. Warden paused and frowned as his and Longhill's eyes met. The Gothrex? Dominic had found Stephanie in the meantime. She was floating in the liquid in one of the larger containers. The sight almost took his mind away. He felt as if cold fingers were thrusting into his chest, clutching his heart in an icy fist. The world seemed to shrink and dissolve. There was nothing left but the image of Stephanie, hanging helpless and naked in her tank, like a specimen in the collection of a madman. They're not dead, Park remarked, pointing to a small pulsing light at the base of one of the containers. That's an ECG and EMG pattern. Faint signals, like hibernation. The words managed to penetrate Dominic's consciousness from afar and prevented him from fainting. His knees were as soft as butter, but he felt his surroundings coagulate back into tangible contours. He examined the switches and displays at the base of the container, trying to make sense of their arrangement. Are you familiar with this, Park? I used to work in an infirmary, the young man replied. And the equipment used by the horseheads here is definitely the product of earthly designers. I recognize some things. Can you wake up the comrades? I'm not a doctor, he said, shaking his head. I'd rather keep my hands off it. Can you do that, Doc? Warden's expression betrayed his helplessness. This is technology beyond my abilities. Cleese cursed under his breath as he paced between the tanks. Why did Brooks want us to see this? He wants Ulan Mestre to see it, informed Dominic. Longhill gave him a long, skeptical look. And what's the point of that? Mestre knows nothing about what his son is up to. Or he closes his eyes to it. But in view of the turmoil his offspring has caused, he has to act. Brooks has only ensured that Akado's attention is focused on the right spot. Brooks could have told him a long time ago. The facility here was secret, Dominic explained. Not even Brooks knew its location until now. I don't give a shit who shows up here, Cleese thundered on. The next horse's head that sticks its snout in here gets a load of ultra-hot plasma. Dominic had always thought Cleese was very controlled. But he had probably reached his limits. And what's the point of that? asked Dominic. It's good for me. Enough now, ordered Longhill. So that we don't cause a disaster, we should close the door first. It won't be long before the Akados show up here to take us back to the Jaber. Until then, let's calm our minds and try to stay sane. Dominic saw that the rows of tanks continued in the darkness at the back of the hall. They were stacked close together as far as the beam of his lamp could reach. The tanks, which were much larger than those in which the humans swam, contained Gothrex in various stages of development. Some were fully grown, black-armored and ready for action. Others were no more than embryos, with thin, rosy skin through which blue veins shimmered. Cleese was speechless. His face was blank with anger. This is a fucking nightmare. The others also vacillated between horror and anger. Dominic also had enough to do to get his emotions under control. His anger agreed with Cleese, who he believed would start a battle as soon as the first Takatos arrived. On the other hand, Stephanie was still alive and there was a vague hope of waking her up from the state she was in. Porter! Longhill's voice echoed through the silence. You have your orders. Get to work. Close the gate. Dominic hurried back to the entrance, used the key and locked the bulkhead. His comrades followed him and sat down in front of the door. They stared ahead of them with distraught expressions. Only after a while did they begin to raid their supplies and eat. Dominic, however, did not feel hungry and decided to return to Stephanie. Where are you going? asked Longhill. The Akata will certainly take a while yet, Dominic replied. You can't know that. I'll be right back. I promise. Cleese reassured his former captain. 
Give the boy some time. I think he's suffered the greatest loss of us all. Longhill seemed to understand, but took a little longer to give his consent. All right, then. But don't dawdle. The sight of Stephanie made Dominic shiver again, so that he finally turned away and leaned against the tank at her feet. He couldn't say what connected him and the young, blonde woman. It wasn't love. They didn't know each other well enough for that and the one time they had sex in the shower was not the start of a serious relationship. They were good comrades who made a perfect team, but even now Dominic wondered whether this camaraderie could ever have turned into a friendship. Outside of their work together as warriors, their differences were too obvious. He couldn't remember ever having a deeper conversation with Stephanie. Not even a casual chat away from tactics, fighting techniques, and strategies. He had to admit to himself that it was more the desire for a relationship that gave him support in the nerve-wracking situations than its actual existence. Stephanie probably just embodied the longing for closeness and reliability that he had felt since the loss of his family. He closed his eyes and tried to ignore the pain that was burning inside him. Dominic didn't realize how he was gradually slipping into a restless sleep. Dream images chased through the fog of his mind. Voices and sounds, like the howling and sighing of the wind. A shadow emerged from the darkness. Bright and flickering restlessly like a flame. The apparition floated rapidly closer until he thought he recognized Stephanie in the vague contours. An unsteady image, reminiscent of a torch in a storm. Stephanie's voice, however, was firm and clear. Are you here to wake me from my rest? Her lips barely moved but the words were loud and booming like the sound of a bell. There's no need to do that. I'm fine with what's happening. Dominic was unable to give her an answer or ask what she meant. No matter how hard he tried to formulate a word, he was unable to. They are transfusing layer after layer of my consciousness onto one of the Gothrex and onto others, the apparition explained. I'm disappearing more and more. But I still remember you. Your face, your eyes, your voice. Soon it will all fade. I can't defend myself against it. I'll fade away like smoke in the wind. Dominic struggled to say something back to her. But his tongue was like a piece of lead in his mouth. Don't be sad, Stephanie continued. I am emerging anew. I have no more fear. My children will fight and die and yet live on. Where they pass into this world, I begin to feel anew. I become one with this world. With the many others who have walked this path before me, I become Barathan. I can't yet say what that means for all of us, but it will be fascinating and wonderful. Do not deprive me of this experience. The vision had lost its misty contours and taken on concrete form. Stephanie's image loomed over him and shone like the sun. The sight alone was overwhelming. Then there was her voice. Commanding. Intimidating like a force of nature. Dominic found it impossible to think clearly or even say a word to her. He thought he was facing a deity that he was not allowed to speak to. Fear welled up inside him. The force and magnitude of the presence of the young woman who had once been Stephanie Dormer left Dominic barely able to breathe. Let me become whatever I want to be, she ordered thunderously. Mind your own business and go. Whatever had become of Stephanie. She horrified him and he feared she would descend on him like a comet in the next second and crush him. They're here, he heard someone say. The voice was far away and reached his ear like a whisper. They're here. Dominic's tongue finally loosened and he answered, even if he didn't know who was talking to him. Who are you talking about? He asked as the dream images gradually melted away like sculptures made of sand. From the horse heads. The sound of the voice had a raspy tone. You have to open the gate. Dominic was still unable to see clearly. His eyes were still fixed on the drifting dream images. Reality was only slowly forming tangible shapes to fill the void left by the vision. Dominic stared into the agitated face of Kelman, who had grabbed him by the shoulders to shake him awake. He pushed Kelman away and got to his feet. Dominic turned briefly to Stephanie, who was resting motionless in her tank. There was nothing terrible about her anymore. There was an expression of deep peace on her face. She looked like a sleeping angel. 
enraptured, moving in supernatural dream worlds. It was not easy to detach himself from this image. Dominic suppressed the impulse to reach out and touch the glass. He couldn't wake her up and bring her back from heaven to the material world. Come on, Kelman urged, staring in suppressed horror at the young woman in her tank. We have to take care of the living comrades. Hesitantly, Dominic Kelman followed the others. They stood ready for battle in front of the closed bulkhead. Open the door, Porter, ordered Longhill. But only a crack. We want to take a look first and not offer a target, should there be hotheads among our Akata friends. Or among us. Cleese felt addressed. I've already got myself under control. From the other side you could hear the muffled hammering of rifle butts and the voice of an Akato. You couldn't make out the words, but it was clear that he was telling people to come out. Dominic inserted the master key into the opening provided in a console on the frame of the gate. You could then hear the mechanism in the wall start to whir. After the two door leaves had slid far enough apart to allow a view of the other side, he pressed a button above the keyhole, which he thought was a stop switch. The engines came to a standstill. Through the resulting opening he saw a troop of about twenty armed Akato. They were in battle armor and seemed ready to pounce on the humans at any moment. The closed helmet visors made the large creatures look even more menacing. Longhill had been right. It was necessary to first create an opportunity to talk and reduce the tension. Ruki Anduraku rumbled the leader of the troop, his voice electronically amplified from his helmet. Come out and surrender, Ableton translated laconically. Tell him we want to talk to the prince, Dominic urged. They'll give us a cough, Cleese said. I'm ready to punch them in the face. Open the gate. Pull yourself together, snorted Longhill. We also have great chances, said Jeremy Leach bitterly. Truka Joro, the Akato growled again. New Audriki. Open the gate, Ableton translated again. Don't fuck around. Refer to Ulan Mestre, Dominic insisted, unintentionally glaring at Longhill. Trust me. The whole time, Longhill never took his eyes off Akato or Dominic. He kept his eyes on Akato even when he turned to Ableton again. Fred? Can you tell them to get the prince? Ableton raised his shoulder apologetically. I can understand what they're saying quite well. But speaking? That's a whole different ball game. Just try it. Not that I'm insulting them. Now get on with it. Frederick Ableton cleared his throat before addressing the Akato. Idro, T I Arakan. Ulan Mestre. The Akato laughed and didn't seem to be able to calm down at all. It became too much for Dominic. He put his weapon in the crack of the door, took off his breastplate and hastily opened his uniform jacket. Are you trying to make the Akato nervous? Longhill wanted to know, and sure enough, the leader of the horsehead stomped up. He raised his rifle and aimed it at Dominic. Don't worry. Dominic reassured him and finally produced the golden uniform button, which he held out to Akato. I'm sure you know this one, don't you? He slowly approached and looked at the piece of gold. He lowered his weapon and opened the sight. He looked at Dominic with his unusually bright blue eyes. Where did you get that? he exclaimed in disbelief. Ah, he speaks our language after all, Dominic realized. From Ulan Mestre himself, he announced not without pride. While the Akato returned to his soldiers to confer with them, Longhill felt compelled to ask Dominic a few questions. Are you joking? His eager gaze kept wandering over to the horses' heads. Where did you get that thing? If you're fooling them right now, they won't hesitate to kill us all. I'm not fooling anyone, Dominic replied confidently. You could at least have told us that. That I'm carrying around a hundred gram piece of gold? And Akato broke away from the group to take a look at the gold piece as well. Then another followed. You received this from our master, one of the two Akato wanted to know. His voice betrayed admiration and awe. He gave it to me personally, Dominic replied. I saved his life. For a moment, the Akato seemed to waver between amazement and skepticism. Surely none of them had ever come so close to the prince to look at his uniform buttons. 
but how else could an insignificant man get his hands on such a large piece of gold emblazoned with the insignia of the ruling house? And from what Dominic had seen so far, there was no one even among the high-ranking Akado who could afford such art and valuable uniform buttons. After more Akado had thoroughly convinced themselves of the authenticity of the piece, they all returned to their posts. They conferred for a while until one of the soldiers hurried away. The leader of the troop approached Longhill and Dominic, peered through the gap and scrutinized the two humans with his blue eyes. We'll see what happens, he grunted. Tuga Ender Skuruku. Ableton tried his hand at the translation. We'll soon find out if you're liars. Chapter 10 As expected, it took quite a while for the prince to arrive. He came accompanied by a retinue of heavily armed, high-ranking Akato. Dominic also saw General Ito among the officers, who all looked grim. Dominic opened the door to let Ulan Mestre and his companions in. Put your weapons on the ground, ordered Longhill. Up with you. Stand still. Salute. The tunnel rats and snowcats took a stance and put their fingers to their temples. Meanwhile, the prince's soldiers collected the humans' rifles. Then they pulled pistols and blades from the guardsmen's belts, which they placed in a pile together with the rifles. Ulan Mestre let his eyes wander over the troop that his son had chosen as his bodyguards. He walked past them, devoting a few seconds to each one, examining them from head to toe. He stopped longer in front of Dominic. He seemed to remember their meeting, which had taken place a good two years ago. It was a good shot. His voice rumbled like a rock fall. A gamble. But you showed nerve and courage. The fate of humanity was in my hands. Dominic clearly remembered the scene in the forest when he had first seen Mestre. He had been aware that he could not miss the skelk who had his fangs on the prince's neck. Just as the image had not faded, neither had the fear he had felt then. The memory was so overwhelming that Dominic's knees buckled for a moment. If he had missed the skelk and hit Ulan Mestre instead, the consequences for Earth would have been incalculable. The fate of two worlds was in your hands, the prince corrected. And that of many more. Dominic didn't know what to say in response. He was too excited at the moment and couldn't think straight. It was partly due to the presence of the prince and partly due to the certainty of all the monstrosities he would see in the next few minutes. It was not clear how Mestre would react and what would happen to Dominic and his companions afterwards. Pota, asked the prince. Porter, Dominic replied. Dominic Porter. Dominic Porter, Ulan Mestre repeated, rolling the R in his name. He turned away from Dominic and strode through the gallery of empty tanks and containers. What am I supposed to be looking at here, Porter? What you are supposed to see is further back. Mestre made a gesture to release the guardsmen from their guard position. Stand at ease. And you come with me, Porter. Mestre's guards exchanged irritated glances and when they made preparations to follow their prince, he told them to stay behind. Dominic stood to the side of the prince, who took the opportunity to exchange a few words with his young companion undisturbed. You have shown yourself to be very resilient, Mestre began, clasping his hands behind his back. People are telling exciting stories about the new guardsmen my son has acquired. Word is spread about the matter on Dostra. Spring on this world is deadly, even for hardier creatures, and you have survived. It wasn't a walk in the park, Dominic replied. But there was a lot of luck involved. Luck is the finger of Otain, said Mestre. A signpost for the believer. Dominic wondered how he would take Otain's hint, which had led him here to force a number of revelations on him in the next few moments. Then the following revelation will be of great use to you, said Dominic. I am convinced that Otain only let us live to show you this place. The first tanks came into view, in which the bodies of unconscious people floated. In the blue rays of light that enveloped them, they looked like pale ghosts floating in the darkness. Dominic thought he saw a shiver shake the prince's body. He walked wordlessly between the containers for quite a while until he stopped in front of Stephanie. Still unable to find an expression for what he was feeling, Dominic stood silently in front of the young woman, who looked as if she was sleeping peacefully. This is my girlfriend, Dominic finally said. 
I say is. Because she's still alive. All my comrades in the tanks are still alive. I don't know what's happening to them. And what Zurak needs them for. The latter was not entirely true. After all, Brooks had already told him some of the facts and other facts were now coming together to form a frightening picture. But he wanted to hear from Mestre himself what he thought about the whole story. Whether he knew anything about it after all and about the role his son played in it. Ulan Mestre was still preoccupied with his own thoughts and apparently unable to give Dominic a clear answer. Finally, he looked down at him. There was an expression in his eyes that Dominic found difficult to interpret. There was regret in them, but also something else that wasn't clear. Dominic would have called it anger, but he was wrong, that much he knew. I turned a blind eye for a long time, said Mestre. Ignored several things that should have been rectified immediately. Jura Harayuker. He paused, taking a breath that sounded like a sigh. The war demands all my senses. It was an excuse that smacked of an excuse. Of course, Mestre's thoughts were with his soldiers and he was worried about his people. But he also knew that this crime should not have happened to the people whose services his sons, and therefore himself, used. As he himself had said, many worlds were in the debt of a single person. Or were those just empty words? Dominic was interested in what Mestre intended to do. What will happen now? I don't think anyone else wants to or should serve under one of your sons. The prince hesitated to answer. First we have to win the battle for Barathon. Then we will see what we have to do. Dominic was more than disappointed by the prince's words. Of course, Mestre put forward reasonable arguments. But they were tinged with evasion. It was as if he was trying to buy time and delay the consequences of the discovery. Dominic had a bad feeling. Not that he expected the prince to prostrate himself before him and beg forgiveness for the sins of his offspring. But a clear condemnation of this criminal matter and the announcement of punishment for those responsible had failed to materialize. You will accompany me, said the prince. I don't have a guard of humans. It's time I acquired one. I personally guarantee your safety. Thank you for your words, Dominic replied, hoping that Mestre could see the double meaning. The prince was no fool, and indeed he paused for a moment. Words always came easily from the tongue and meant nothing when the situation called for action. In this context, Dominic was keenly interested in what would happen to Zurak now, but it was probably better to let the matter rest for the time being. How is the war against the Kimon going? Dominic asked instead, immediately regretting having raised this point. Mestre gave no answer. After all, he seemed to find it difficult to tell the untruth. A plus point that Dominic wanted to give him for the time being. We are fighting with all our might, said the prince. We will not back down. The Kimon are obviously doing the same thing. Mestre's voice lost any kind tone. We will defeat and destroy them. Do you doubt that victory will be ours? Given that this war had been going on for centuries, his confidence seemed more than unlikely. Surely the luck of battle was always changing and from what Dominic could make out, the Kimon were just about to gain the upper hand again. It was better to change the subject and get back to the real reason she was here. What can we do for my comrades? asked Dominic. We have to get them out of there. The prince looked at the people in the tanks. We'll get Zurak's scientists here. They will solve the problem. Dominic thought back to the dream he had had a few hours ago. Or had it been more of a vision? A message from Stephanie, who didn't want her to be freed. Was that also true for the other soldiers? He had received no such vision from them. Were they unable to express themselves? Had their minds already gone blank? Dominic dismissed his thoughts as nonsense. The dream image was certainly the result of fatigue and a fervent desire to see Stephanie again. There was certainly nothing more to it than that. Chapter 11 The fighting for Barathon was still going on. Quicker than expected, Dominic and the remaining comrades found themselves in the ranks of the warriors who were now going into battle with the prince. Now Dominic wished they were under arrest for a while longer, like the Akato soldiers under Zurak's command. 
Instead, they were dressed in new battle gear, with the emblem of the princely house emblazoned on the center of their armor. The light armor was made of the almost indestructible, reddish wood from which the armor they had braved the winter on Dostra was made. Longhill was now in command of the guard as captain, replacing Roderick Miles, who reported to him as an officer. Dominic also held the rank of officer and now officially received Longhill's orders. He enjoyed making Davis and Skorsky dance to his tune. So far, the opportunities to do so had been few and far between, but he had enjoyed them and hoped for more. It wasn't because the two of them had ever treated him unfairly and he felt the need to get back at them. He resented their secrecy and assumed that they somehow knew about the machinations of the prince's sons. Indirectly, he blamed them for what had happened to Stephanie. He wanted to make them realize how angry he was. Maybe that would persuade them to come clean at some point. There had been opportunities to put a gun to their heads, but given the battle situation, he refrained from confronting them. Further revelations would complicate the relationship and nobody needed that at the moment. Or was he just afraid that a few clear words would reveal new truths that he didn't want to deal with just yet? The small command ship worked its way through the roaring atmosphere of Barathon, which shook the ship's hull and made it glow. Mestre had decided to make a steep entry into the planet's atmosphere in order to quickly come to the aid of his troops, who were involved in a ground battle on one of the continents. The ship hurtled towards the battle on the surface like a meteor. The protective fields were compressed into wafer-thin layers and were barely able to dissipate the frictional heat. Flames flickered across the hull and licked at the edges of the bridge bulkhead. The helmsman shouted something and sounded the alarm. Immediately afterwards, some vibrations caused the ship's structure to groan. Three four blows crashed against the outer hull, but did not knock the vehicle off course. Dominic had experienced something similar in the last few hours on board the Skitra. The Kimon had boarding ships that were constructed on the same principle as the boarding wedges used by the Earth fleet. They penetrated the armor of a spaceship, opened up inside it and released the boarding troops. Dominic felt the Skelks entering the ship and running through the corridors. Some were struck down, others continued to advance. Get to work, ordered Longhill and the troops formed up to join the fight. Porter, you form the center. Deliver us the positions of the beasts. While the ship dropped like a stone from the sky, the guardsmen fought against Skelks advancing towards the bridge. But the invaders had no chance of succeeding. By the time the ship reached the ground, the Kimon were defeated and their corpses lay in the corridors. The ship's hatches opened and the crew hurried outside. They had to eliminate all the launchers from which the Kimon were launching their boarding ships, making it impossible for the Akado to secure the orbit around Barathon. By now the large Kimon battleships had been driven off, but as long as the Beatles could use their boarding wedges, which they launched into the sky from the ground, this victory was indefensible. The Kimon gathered around the massive bastion ship, which was able to hold its position over one of the continents. Once the launchers were destroyed, Mestre would be able to attack this fortress without being harassed from the ground. The battlefield was a huge burning plain, where armored vehicles and heavily armed gliders moved about. Here and there, the spider-like machines of the Kimon could be seen stamping across the scorched earth. The ashen gray sky, streaked with clouds of smoke, barely allowed the sunlight to filter through. The only vehicles that dared to fly over the land were small Akata fighters and bombers, but they were met by heavy defensive fire. There were small gunner nests everywhere, which caused considerable problems for the Akata foot soldiers and, with their heavier calibers, caused one or two landing craft to crash. The prince's plan was to fight his way across the plain and eliminate the Kimon's positions with small battle formations. The Tunnel Rats and Snowcats target was about 30 kilometers away, hidden between many hills. A bunker complex that dated back to the time when the Akato ruled Barathon and was now being used by the enemy. It was the heart of the hastily erected Kimon defensive structures, the one that caused the most damage to the Akato ships. From there the boarding wedges were launched, while from the surrounding mountains plasma mortars launched their deadly projectiles into space. Ulan Mestre came accompanied by Ido and about 500 selected soldiers. They were all clad in armor made of reddish armored wood and held heavy rifles in their hands. 
they also had long bayonets hanging from their belts like short swords. The command ship's launchers opened fire and took precautionary measures to cover the area where Ulan Mestre intended to advance on the bunker. Porter and Longhill, Ulan Mestre's voice boomed over the din of battle. Together they formed the core of the force. Move forward. Longhill and Porter did not hesitate for long and set off in the direction of a river valley that meandered in numerous twists and turns to the target. Mestre hoped that they would be able to work their way to the enemy unseen. More gliders left the ship in which the troops had just arrived, steam and smoke still rising from its hull. The fighters took fire on the hills around the deployment area. Longhill seized the moment to express his concerns and turned to the prince. If the gliders cover our advance, the secrecy will be over. He shouted against the noise. Then we might as well knock on the Keeman's door. General Ito agreed with Longhill's concerns and exchanged a few words with his master, who then ordered the gliders to take fire on another section of the battlefield. Dominic suddenly felt defenseless and at the mercy of others. But Longhill was right. They couldn't let the Kimon know with their noses that they were in danger from the river valley. Finally, the command ship also flew away to settle further away and well protected between two hills. The troop of humans in Akato stumbled down the slope. Between trees, bushes and boulders and into knee-deep mud. The river had disappeared and its bed was filled with ash and churned up earth. There was only a small trickle of water left, drawing thin veins in the black mud. Apparently, the water had chosen a new course under the bombardment. It was also possible that it had dammed up somewhere behind a wall of uprooted trees and rubble to form a lake that could break at any time. Another sword of Damocles, ready to descend on them at any moment. Dusk and night came quickly, but the sky blazed with gunfire and explosions, as if a thousand suns were trying to rise above the horizon at the same time. Ulan Mestre ordered them to march on, allowing himself and his warriors little rest. They seemed to be extremely combative anyway and certainly only saw the humans as an obstacle that slowed down their march. However, they recognized the advantage their new comrades offered them by locating all the skelks before they could get too close to the troop. Thanks to the humans, the Akado always knew from which direction danger was threatening them and how big it was. Morning finally came. The sun was actually able to send its red rays through the clouds of smoke. It made the tops of the trees that remained above the embankment glow. Dominic felt a cluster of Kimon a good five to six kilometers away. Based on their positions and movements, he was able to trace the underground structure of the bunker in his mind. He was also able to sneak into the minds of some of the Kimon who were in command there. They were the kind of Kimon he had encountered at the Chester Habitat and the Baxter Station. Through their eyes, Dominic managed to see details of the bunker facility and the launch pads. It was huge and teeming with skelks preparing to climb into the boarding wedges. Dominic doubted that they would be able to take the fortress and destroy the launch pads. What can you tell us, Porter? asked the captain. You look so thoughtful. Are you in contact? We have to go this way, he informed Longhill, pointing to a side valley that branched off from the main stream and in which a clear little brook flowed. Here the vegetation was much denser again and unscathed by the destruction of the barrage. It took them almost two hours to work their way through the narrow valley to one of the bunker entrances. It was on a slope and was open. A few steps led down from there to a paved path that led along the slope of the valley and finally upwards. Dominic felt a crowd of skelks moving towards the exit. Can you tell me something? asked Longhill. The reception committee consists of nine skelks, led by a two-legged Kimon, Dominic informed us. I have the impression that they haven't noticed us yet. Ulan Mestre came to find out how things were going and then retreated with his men into the shelter of the vegetation. For the moment, it was better to leave the field to the humans. The opportunities for brute force, in which the Akado were undefeated masters, would still arise. In the meantime, the bombardment intensified again. Dominic could hear the roar of engines. A battle group approaching and moving away again. Nearby, a projectile smashed into the ground. Now do Porter, said Longhill. You have the eyes of Pythia. Surprise me. Dominic was taken by surprise. 
but only for a brief moment. He was surprised himself at how quickly he came up with a strategy to penetrate the bunker. He pointed up the slope. Kelman, Gardner, Leach. Position yourselves above the entrance. One came on nine skelks. We'll let them come out and then take them in crossfire. Secure the entrance when we've finished them off. Davis raised his hand. Skorsky and I request permission to accompany Kelman. It was still a surreal feeling to be approached by Davis in this way. It took Dominic a few moments to respond and give his consent. Of course. Make yourself useful. Skorsky smiled wryly and condescendingly. Sure thing. We'll try to make ourselves useful. Longhill ordered a handful of his men to follow the snowcats. The others, take cover. The Kimon must all be out before we can finish them off. The soldiers entrenched themselves behind rocks, bushes, and fallen tree trunks. Dominic watched as his comrades climbed the slope and hid behind bushes and stones above the bunker exit. Kelman, he whispered into his helmet's communicator and received confirmation from his comrade. They'll be out in a moment. First the Skelks. The two-legged Kimon will follow last. We'll wait until he's outside. We have to take him out first before we take on the Skelks. He'll try to bar the entrance as soon as the first shot is fired. Kelman confirmed again and ended the contact. Longhill raised his rifle and peered through the scope. As soon as the two-legged Kimon shows up, I'll lob a grenade into the entrance. Just to make sure he doesn't get a chance to lock the door. Dominic didn't think that was a good idea. That will alert the others in the bunker. With all the shelling here, they won't notice a thing, replied Longhill. And if they do, we have Superman. And he'll sort things out. Dominic turned to Tina Bowers, who was crouched on the ground next to him. I'd like you to take out the Kimon with a precise shot before Longhill starts lobbing grenades. I can handle it, replied Bowers, who had proved herself to be a good shot, and made a few adjustments to the sight on her weapon. She had just finished when the first sniffers jumped out into the open. Seemingly aimlessly, they chased down into the river valley or ran along the embankment. Two of them climbed the slope and approached the spot where Kelman and his troop had taken up position. Dominic hoped that his comrades would not lose their nerve and open fire before Bowers could fire. He heard Longhill take the safety off his grenade launcher. Meanwhile, a group of Skelks were hurrying towards their location. They approached quickly and purposefully, as if they had already spotted the humans. Dominic continued to keep an eye on the bunker entrance. He thought he saw something metallic glinting inside. The light of the morning sun slanted into the tunnel and reflected off the Keeman's silver armor. The plasma beam from Bauer's rifle illuminated the shadow where the river valley still lay and struck the Keeman with the force of a lightning bolt. The creature fell backwards to the ground and remained in the bunker entrance. Longhill pulled up and lobbed his grenade into the group of Skelks, who by now had come so close that their panting could be heard. The soldiers took cover as the explosive detonated. Earth, stones, leaves and pieces of Kimon body rained down. A shower of entrails and greenish blood descended on the soldiers. The stench that spread was unbearable. Dominic heard shots from the other side. As he picked himself up and peered through the clearing cloud of smoke, he saw Kelman hurrying into the tunnel while the others offered him cover. The remaining Skelks were quickly defeated and Dominic felt a sense of triumph. He had led his first commando and succeeded. Longhill spared a word of praise and urged his troops to follow him. How many more Kimon are there, he wanted to know from Dominic as they climbed the slope to enter the bunker. And where are they? Dominic climbed awkwardly over slippery stones and damp ground. He slipped on a patch of grass or Kimon and sat down roughly on the seat of his pants. I can only guess, he gasped and pulled himself to his feet. About seven to eight hundred. They're spread all over the station. A good thirty bipeds in a larger room nearby. I locate five skelks three hundred meters away. They're coming towards us through the tunnel. Kelman stepped out of the bunker entrance. Secured. He shouted. Inner bunker door is open. 
beetles approaching, shouted Longhill to Kelman, who then disappeared into the tunnel with his companions. Seconds later, the sound of projectiles rang in Dominic's ears. All five down, Kelman announced over the communicator. We'll take up position and wait for you to catch up with us. Dominic could feel the other Kimon moving in the tunnels, but then they stayed put. They had obviously noticed that the enemy had entered the bunker and needed new orders. What are the bugs doing now? asked Longhill. Most of them are in a state of shock, Dominic replied. Now they're moving again. They're all retreating towards the big room where the Kimon leaders are. They're taking up a defensive position, the captain concluded. Ulan Mastray's voice thundered through the valley. Forward. Guardsmen to the front. Chapter 12 The battles in the tunnels were among the most intense experiences Dominic could remember. The battle at Baxter Station had been the most intense combat experience to date. But it was nothing like what Dominic and his comrades were currently experiencing. The Kimon charged at the people with full force. Wave after wave pushed relentlessly through the main corridor. Skelks poured out of side passages and shafts to pounce on the soldiers with claws, teeth and jaw pincers. Thanks to Dominic's skills, the Skelks did not manage to surprise the intruders, but they often had to let the monsters get close to them when they approached from angled passages. In this case, there was little chance of killing them from a distance. Guardsmen in Akato were able to fend off their attacks every time, but the fight was gradually wearing thin. The stream of monsters seemed unstoppable and left no time to catch their breath. Added to this were the cramped conditions and the darkness in the tunnels, which made life difficult for all the prince's warriors. Longhill in particular was obviously struggling with claustrophobia. His breathing was heavy and there was a look of burgeoning panic in his eyes. His movements became erratic and several shots missed their target. Get behind me, Dominic asked the captain. Preferably in the very back row. Do you have any other suggestions, Porter? Longhill said indignantly, and again one of his shots missed. The overheated rifle did not release the next shot, no matter how many times Longhill pulled the trigger. You're endangering the troops right now, Dominic dared to rebuke the captain, pushing him aside as the comrades stepped over the bodies of countless skelks. Get to the back. You're forgetting what rank you hold. And you're forgetting what responsibility you have. Longhill was momentarily dismayed. His lips quivered. Surely he was searching for the right words to hurl in Dominic's face. His gaze was feverish and showed that he was currently unable to form a meaningful thought. The roar of more skelks echoed through the dark corridors and seemed to aggravate him even more. The captain looked around for Ableton and Cleese, who were waiting for the monsters with the others at the head of the troop. There's a crossroads about fifty meters away, Dominic called out to them. Two tunnels branching off to the left and right. From the right, three skelks, three hundred meters away. From the left, eight skelks, four hundred meters away. Your task, Davis. A group of tunnel rats set out with Davis to prepare the passages with explosive charges. In the semi darkness created by the many lamps above the gun barrels, Dominic could see Longhill sweating and shivering. We can do without you, Dominic hissed. You're expendable at the moment. Superman is in charge now. Longhill forced himself to concede. All right, Porter. But don't get megalomaniacal just because you've succeeded once. The demolition squad returned and rejoined the troops. Seconds later, an explosion shook the bunker and shortly afterwards a second one. Ten skelks ahead. Dominic shouted against the echo of the detonations. They're closing fast. 200 meters. 150. 100. The first volleys whipped through the darkness and struck down some of the monsters that appeared in the beams of the headlights. Other skelks leapt over the bodies of their fellows and managed to penetrate the ranks of the guardsmen. Screams rang out as some of the tunnel rats fell into the clutches of the monsters. Longhill regained his composure, pushed Dominic aside, and raised his rifle. He fired a sheaf and hit a skelk, splitting its head in half. The Akato also rejoined the fight, firing one plasma volley after another into the fray. I told you, said the captain. 
stay on the carpet. Long Il grabbed Dominic and pushed him back into the ranks of the fighters. They still had a long way to go and the Skelks were constantly attacking. Gradually, the guardsmen and Akato began to show signs of fatigue. And although Dominic's information was still precise and clear, some humans in Akato were killed. Kelman received a paw blow and had to be tended to. Together with Doc Warden, an Akato doctor and some of the prince's warriors, they stayed behind in the main corridor. Long Hill continued to try not to show his fear, but gradually he dropped back. Just before they reached one of the large halls, the soldiers switched off the telltale rifle lights. Now it was time to activate the night vision visors, which would not have been helpful in the tunnel battle. The reflections of the bullets and explosions on the tunnel walls impaired their visibility and rendered them useless for combat. In larger rooms, however, they could be used again. Under the cover of darkness, the soldiers worked their way to the entrance. The hall had a circular base and a domed roof with a hole through which the sky could be seen. The vault was dominated by a bazaar launcher, aimed like a spike at the opening in the dome. A number of boarding ships were waiting to be loaded into the machine's magazine. The gun did not appear to be active at the moment. That wasn't surprising, since the Akata fleet wasn't providing a target at the moment and was staying out of range. The bunker's gun niches were occupied, however, and the Kimon gunners were raking the battlefield outside the walls. The crack of their guns and the thunder of impacting shells echoed through the room. The Kimon had not yet noticed that the enemy had reached the center of the fortress. They carried out their tasks without paying any attention to their surroundings. They obviously had no idea that their guard dogs could no longer protect them. Ulan Mestre appeared at Longhill's side still hesitant to attack the Kimon. Their armor was hard to crack from this distance. Bowers was a good shot, but at best she could take out two or three of the Kimon before the others returned fire. Longhill's voice came out of the helmet loudspeaker. Madre, Connard, Bowers. Front row. Pick up your targets. Fire as soon as they're aligned. Tina Bowers squeezed past Dominic, panting, to follow Longhill's orders with the other shooters. Ulan Mestre watched the action and ventured further forward with some of his soldiers. He held a rifle that also had an optical sight and which he could use as a sniper in the battle. He peered through the eyepiece and got an overview of the situation. Dominic was adjusting the settings on his night visor when he sensed the presence of Sklex. Not the Sklex he had already detected who were moving in the more distant tunnels of the facility. The feeling was overpowering and almost robbed him of his senses. He looked up at Mestre. We're under attack, he said quietly. His voice trembled with horror. The Akato lowered his weapon and looked at Dominic. How many? From where? Thousands, Dominic replied. There are so many that I can't tell their number. They're coming from the labyrinth on the other side of the hall. They'll be here in a few minutes. Almost simultaneously, the snipers took their targets under fire. The shots sounded like a single bang. Two Kimon fell to the ground. Another took cover, hit but not incapacitated, and responded with a volley that punched glowing holes in the ground in front of the prince's soldiers. Get out now, shouted Longhill and ran out of the corridor. Spread out. The Kimon did not manage to get to safety quickly enough. The surprise was successful and the Akato stormed into the hall. Even the prince was not above avoiding the fight. He proved to be an unerring marksman and fearless fighter, rushing to the head of his troops. The Kimon put up a fierce fight and struck down a number of Akato, but in the end they were defeated. Their guns fell silent. All that could be heard was the bombardment of the artillery, which was now getting closer to the bunker. One hit sent dust and stones raining down from the ceiling. Mestre turned to Dominic. How much time do we have left? Dominic estimated the speed at which the Skelks were moving. Five minutes at most. The prince gave a few orders to his fellows, who then attached explosive charges to the launching ramps and the boarding ships provided. He then ordered a retreat as the first Skelks poured into the hall. Like a flood, they burst in from corridors and passageways. Some fell under the sheaves of the guardsmen and Akato, but that did not stop them. 
the monsters leapt over their fallen comrades and chased towards their enemies. We've waited too long, whispered Longhill. Mestre shouted, Rocker. Rocker, as the first explosives detonated. The blast shattered several hundred skelks and threw Mestre and his soldiers to the ground. When they had picked themselves up again, the prince drove the Akado and their human allies into the corridor. More explosions shook the bunker. Dominic heard how the vault groaned and how large blocks of rock came crashing down. Burning hot air swept through the tunnel. Clouds of smoke and sparks whirled around Dominic's head. The filter system in his helmet began to work. Dominic didn't know how long he had been walking through the darkness, flanked by the giant Akado that looked like armored dinosaurs. More than once he feared being trampled by them. Again and again they had to climb over the bodies of the skelks they had previously killed. He marveled at how many they had hunted down. It took effort to work their way over the twisted limbs of the monsters that filled the corridor. It was some time before they reached the part of the corridor where there were hardly any dead enemies left. Now the soldiers sprinted through the darkness again. Dominic's body was dripping with sweat. He was grateful when they slowed down to pick up the wounded they had had to leave behind. Dominic and Leech grabbed Kelman and dragged him along the corridor. He screamed incessantly, even though Doc Warden administered one ampoule of painkiller after another. Give him another one, Dominic demanded, but Doc waved him off. If he faints, you'll hardly be able to drag him along, Doc replied. He'll have to pull himself together and join in as best he can. Meanwhile, the hissing and roaring of the angry skelks could be heard as they chased after them. An Akata fired a rocket that exploded far back in the tunnel. Nevertheless, the shock wave almost knocked Dominic to the ground. The fool must want to kill us all, cursed Leech and Ulan Mestre also swore in the harsh words of the Akata language. Finally, the exit came into view. A small, bright square in the blackness. It was infinitely far away. As the troop had to squeeze past another pile of Kimon corpses, Andrew Gardner stopped and asked his comrades to hand him their rifles and ammunition. What are you up to? Dominic wanted to know, although he could have saved himself the trouble of asking. It was all too obvious what Gardner had in mind. Give me Kelman's gun and his ammunition, he demanded. Go ahead. He doesn't need it. Skorsky handed Gardner the portable grenade launcher and the accompanying projectiles. Dominic was appalled at the casualness with which he did this. A quick pat on the back was all the attention Gardner got from Skorsky. Dominic called himself a weakling as he wordlessly slipped Gardner an energy magazine. Farewell speeches and heroic chants would have to wait. Gardner himself urged them to hurry and grabbed one of the stinking skull carcasses to use as cover. Get out of here, he hissed, firing a volley of plasma projectiles in the direction of their pursuers. Get out of here. Get out of here. It was a terrible feeling to set off and leave a comrade behind, even if he wanted to. It didn't matter. Someone in the squad would die so that others would survive. It still felt like a failure. It was a failure, there was no doubt about that. They should have all returned from this mission in one piece. They had sworn it to each other. Dominic would have preferred to stay with Gardner, just so he wouldn't feel like a coward. A strangely vain thought, Dominic thought. As if it were a competition in sacrifice. A monument for the pigeons to shit on. Kelman's screams and the defensive fire Gardner unleashed tore Dominic from his thoughts. The square of sunlight had moved a good deal closer. Kelman was barely conscious and hung heavy as a sack of cement between Porter and Leech. We'll have to carry him, Doc Warden suggested. I'll take him by the feet. The Akado reached the exit. Several of the tunnel rats were already rushing out into the open. Only Longhill, Cleese, Ableton, Davis and Skorsky formed the rearguard together with the wounded and their carriers. They were joined by a pair of Akado, who kept looking back and watching as Gardner lit his hellfire. The energy bolts coursed towards the monsters pushing through the tunnel. A wall of fangs, pincers and claws became visible in the light of the energy bolts. Finally, grenades exploded as Gardner's gun fell silent. Hot air billowed over Dominic and his companions. Keep going, 
Keep going, shouted Longhill. No more time to lose. The guardsmen and the rest of the Akato rushed towards the exit. It wasn't far now, but Dominic was at the end of his tether. He deactivated the night vision display the brighter the sunlight entered the tunnel. He could see the blue-green of the river valley glowing in the light of the midday sun as a powerful detonation shook the corridor. The shockwave felt like a horse kick in the back. Dominic hit the walls and ceiling several times before he was thrown into the daylight and rolled down the slope. He fell into the water and was unable to pick himself up. The world spun like a merry-go-round as the cold water ran down Dominic's face. A cacophony of whistling and buzzing shrilled in his ears. With difficulty, he pushed himself up onto his knees and stared at a swirling world of patches of blue-green vegetation and azure sky. Silhouettes of Akato moving lumberingly through the undergrowth, as if in slow motion. A guardsman lying motionless between ferns and bushes and skelks charging through the valley. Dominic fumbled for his rifle. It was gone. His fingers touched the pistol in its holster on Dominic's belt. He pulled it out and aimed as best he could at one of the monsters, which leapt at him with bared teeth. That little gun won't do me much good, were his last thoughts, then he pulled the trigger.